Okay, good morning. All right, I hear myself. Today is Monday, April 22nd, 2024. It is 9 a.m. and we are in the city chambers and I call the city commission workshop to order. This will be a hybrid meeting if all goes well. Um, this meeting has been properly noticed and will be conducted as a hybrid meeting requiring the use of communications media technology. A physical quorum of voting members is present in city commission chambers. A hybrid meeting allows voting members to attend and participate without being physically present in the room where this quorum is convened. So roll call up here. Uh, there's myself, Mayor White, Vice Mayor Stokes, Commissioner Langdon, and Commissioner McDowell. Do we have Commissioner Emrich on yet? Okay, he will make his statement when you let us know when he comes on, correct? Okay, so we have to wait to approve the use of CMT until he does make that statement. Also present are City Manager Fletcher, City Assistant City Attorney uh, Golan, uh, City Clerk Faust, Board Specialist uh, Bodmer, Police Chief Garrison I saw back there, thank you, and Deputy F Fire Chief Hurley, do we have that right? Thank you, all right. Um, Pledge of Allegiance, can I call on uh, Director Ray to uh, yeah. lead us in the pledge? Thank you. <laughs> Your face. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, do we have public comment? We have one voicemail. Okay. Workshop meeting Monday, April 22nd on Sunday. I am Evelyn Emmerich at 941-800-6490. Dear Commissioners, I am Evelyn, a 10-year-old resident of North Fort. I often help put temporary signs out for free family events and activities to raise money for kids in need. I also learned about I-9 Sports Flag Football sign up through a sign I saw in the corner of Toledo Blade and Price Boulevard. I thought it would be fun, so I asked my mom if she could sign up my annoying brother and I to play flag football. She took a picture of the sign and signed us up for the league. I was pretty good at it, too. I stole my brother's flag several times. My family came to all of my games. If it wasn't for the signs, I wouldn't have won a trophy. Without signs in our neighborhood, we wouldn't have known about I-9 and other community events. Anytime I help put up signs, I make sure I do it safely. I help take them down to be responsible. Please allow some signs in my neighborhood by Woodland Middle School and Atwater Elementary so that I can keep telling my mom about things going on in our community. I'm not allowed to, and I don't get the newspaper so I don't learn about fun kid activities. We don't always get flyers about free events at our school. I just look for signs as we are driving through the town. For me, they are not a distraction. They inform me of things that may interest me or my annoying older brother. Thank you for considering young people's opinions about the value of signs in North Port. In person, we have Bob Burkhart, followed by Deborah Placencia and Ariana Campbell. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Bob Burkhart. My wife and I have been uh, lived in Heron Creek for the last 20 years. Today, I wish to express my strong opposition to the proposed expansion of Activity Center 2 in the ULDC to include all of the residences and golf course in Heron Creek. According to the city's own council, Jennifer Cohen, since 1997 to the present time, the Heron Creek development has been divided into two primary land use categories, as in the future land use map. The one, the activity center comprising the Heron Creek Town Center and a portion of the residential golf course area, 
which is zoned mixed use, and two, the low density area in the Heron Creek Golf Community. Currently, the proposed ULDC would include both land use categories in a single activity, center two, which would be zoned mixed use. We are extremely concerned that this change of zoning is just a step in the process of the developer converting all or a portion of the golf course to other purposes. Why do we have these fears? On March 27, 2020, Ms. Nicole Galehaus of the city wrote an email to Mr. Ron York and Jim Bevelard, the developers, along with other members of her staff, summarizing their meeting. Here's a quote. In order to evaluate a potential reduction in the number of holes in the course, planning will run the fiscal impact model for 100 acres of golf course, multifamily, and single family to see what the different impact is for each type. On June 3, 2020, Mr. Peter Lear, the then city manager, responded to a letter from Mrs. York and Bevelard regarding their inquiries, which included, in the event we move to convert existing golf course acreage into alternative development uses, please provide us with both a suggested pathway to approval as well as your best guess as to potential conditions that could reside, uh, arise as a result. Yes, we are very concerned with the expansion of Activity Center 2. What is the motivation of the city to expand Activity Center 2? Aaron Creek residents will not benefit. I find it difficult to see how the city will benefit. The only party that could benefit from this action is the developer. We strongly request two actions. One, reject the proposed expansion of Activity Center 2 in the proposed ULDC. Two, modify the current Activity Center 2 map, making all residential and golf course areas of Heron Creek low density residential. If the planning and zoning department has the belief that residential golf course communities should be designated as activity centers, why doesn't this apply to Bobcat Trail? Why doesn't it apply to Welland Park Golf and Country Club? Why is Heron Creek the only one being targeted? Please do the right thing and reject this expansion and eliminate the activity center designation to our residential golf course sections of Heron Creek. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time, too. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's really good. Now I can take a breath. <laughs> All right, who was next? Deborah Placencia. Good morning, Commissioners, City Manager, Miss Ray. I've spoken my with my there you go. Oh, are we ready? I've spoken with my headspace the previous 10 weeks to chairs of committees, the city managers, the city commissioners, public meetings, county it's a, it's The ladies on there members. speaking. Hold on. I'm sorry? Just a second. Oh, sorry. It's somebody. Okay. I'm reclaiming my time. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are we good? Is he off? That's Commissioner Emmett's trying to get. Oh, okay. Get him, but that's fine. Good. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> This was all precipitated by my building permit being put on hold by the zoning review in February because my lot is in an activity center planned 17 years ago for a future land use of medium high density residential, commercial, industrial land use. My lot is zoned for low density residential. I learned this area was never rezoned to align with the 17 year old comp plan, although 68 single family homes have been allowed by the city to be permitted scattered throughout the three neighborhoods of Barcelona Circle, Dalewood Circle, and Hampshire Circle. I reviewed the ULDC <clears throat> guidelines in which none of the proposed AC6 land use will fit on the quarter acre lots of 80 foot frontages, the majority of the lots in these areas. We remain obliged to pay property taxes on these lots we're not allowed to build on. The established houses will be considered non-conforming structures, which means they are not allowed to be expanded or rebuilt if destroyed unless aligned with the rezoned ordinance according to the ULDC guidelines. I wonder if the rezoning change suggested is out of scale with the character of these established neighborhoods now. So here we are today. I'm not trained as a city planner, so I can only speak from experience of a Midwesterner transplanted to Florida. One cannot fit a square peg in a round hole. I wonder whether the AC6 boundaries are illogically drawn in relation to the now existing conditions for our three neighborhoods south of I-75 proposed for rezoning change. Now I'm speaking from my heart space. The city commissioners have been presented with three choices for the future zoning of our three established neighborhoods of 68 homes. One, to continue with the AC6 rezoning, which will significantly impact a lot homeowners financially, 
and they have delivered the possibility of their homes being bulldozed to allow single family homes only on certain blocks or lots in AC6 Dalewood Circle, not inclusive of all neighborhoods, and allow single family homes in AC6 south of I-75. I wonder if there are substantial reasons why these three neighborhood properties cannot remain in accord with the existing zoning ordinance or be amended to low medium density for the three <coughs> these three single family established neighborhoods. Since there are no AC6 proposed land uses beyond, besides medium density residential that will fit within the character of these established neighborhoods and there are a thousand plus AC6 developed undeveloped acres. Again, I'm not trained as a city planner. I'm just speaking as a retired woman who chose to build my dream home in Northport. I have spoken with a lot of my neighbors who have no clue what's happening here and they are now informed, most of them, not all the lot owners, but they agree. This is very important to us that we be able to, con to continue to live in our neighborhoods safely and allow the five building permits on hold to move forward and enjoy the city of Northport. Thank you. Thank you. Do we want to uh, go back a city clerk and, and get Commissioner Emmerich? Okay, before we move on with any more public comments. So he's on the record as being, being here. Okay. All right, there he is. Good morning, Commissioner. Good good morning. All right. We're ready for your statement. I am so I am so sorry that my computer was not working this morning. Oh, that's fine. We see you have the phone to your ear, so that's good. Yeah, I'm still in contact with IT. All right. All right. As authorized by City Commission Policy number 2021-10, I am attending this hybrid meeting via communications media technologies. I am experiencing a medical condition, including many disabilities preventing me from attending in person at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm looking for a motion to approve the use of CMT for this hybrid meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, I have- I we, speak to the motion. Yes, go ahead. We are in a workshop, and by policy, we are not allowed to make motions. You can make administrative motions. They can just not be action items. Thank you. All right, so I have a motion by Commissioner Langdon to approve the use of CMT for this hybrid meeting, and that was seconded by Vice Mayor Stokes. So if there's nothing else, we're going to do a voice vote. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. Uh, Mayor White, I'm a yes. Commissioner Langdon, I'm a yes. Commissioner McDowell, yes. And Commissioner Emmerich. Are you there? There he is. I, I don't know what's going on. I, I said yes three times. I don't know why it's not working. Okay, we, we hear you now. So that's a yes. Okay, so that passes five to zero. All right, thank you. We'll continue with public comment. Good morning, commissioners and city staff. My name is Ariana Campbell. I brought this photo of my daughter to share with you guys. Um, I get it to stay there. My husband and I purchased a, 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 we own a property in Activity Center 6. We purchased this property with all of our hopes and dreams in tow. My husband has relentlessly worked two jobs, 16 hours a day, six days a week, to place us in a position to facilitate this endeavor. We have obtained a mortgage, funds have been dispersed, and the materials for this home are already purchased. Over the course of months, we have completed all testing requested by the building department to build a single family home in this location. Our application was accepted and paid for Never did any personnel within this department disclose any conflict with zoning in this location. There has been a huge error made at the hands of this department, and nobody but the citizens of this city are paying for it. Without the correction of this mistake, there's no fault our own. 
My husband and I, at the age of 30 years old, will be staring at $300,000 in debt. Our five-year-old daughter, who is intending to start kindergarten this fall, each night at bedtime, when the three of us go into our single room, we all climb into one bed at night, she asks me now, Mommy, when are we going home? And it breaks me to my core that my daughter is suffering like this. She deserves to go home. We don't deserve this. We've done nothing wrong. Zahara does not deserve this. We're all human and mistakes are made. But accountability is key here. This error needs to be made right. And I humbly and with all due respect, I ask the five of you commissioners, you have the power to change this. You have the power to make this right. And I urge you to search your hearts and search your souls as you vote and ask yourself, is this how you vow to represent your city and the citizens that live here? More importantly, I ask you, <coughs> To ask yourself, can you sleep at night knowing that you've stacked the chips of homelessness and poverty against a five-year-old? We have nowhere to go. This is all that we have. And I ask that you please take all of that into consideration before you vote. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have a fancy speech or anything, <clears throat> and I did get sick, so <clears throat> her speech was very moving, and mine is also the same. My husband and I purchased a piece of property on Short Yorkshire. <sighs> it's near Yorkshire. It's um, Whip Tree Circle, and we have two neighbors that we really like. Um, <clears throat> my name's Julius and Savage. I'm a veteran. I'm a mom of three children. I'm a semi-truck driver. I'm a business owner. I go to school every day at the Punta Gorda Airport so I can learn how to become an airframe mechanic. Airframe and power plant mechanic. To fix airplanes. So I know a lot and I've done a lot. And my husband and I are very motivated to work on that property that we purchased just like three years ago. I'm not exact on dates. But we were in the process of building our dream house. It wasn't a small, little, tiny cottage. It was a massive project. And my husband and I were... We're on a well, well, we were well on our way. We had our property permits filed. We had the paperwork. We had the land cleared. We sold our house in Wisconsin to finance our project. So we were well on our way. And then there was one day when we were doing the pipe, pipings for the plumbing, and we were just a week away from pouring concrete. My husband received a phone call, and that phone call said there was a man that said that he could no longer work on this house that we've been planning for over two years. A lot of time and effort and money has been spent, and that one phone call ended everything, and he was devastated. He was depressed. I'm more positive, so I just took the opportunity and try to make the best of the situation, but he was shaken to the core. So I urged 
everyone in this room to reconsider <clears throat> just leaving the property of activity zone center six and the residents to be able to build their dream houses like my husband and our family. And that's all, you know, we just want to have our homes built and be left alone. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, staff. Um, my name is Josh Smith. Uh, I live out off Price and um, Janine. Um, I actually kind of have a good thing. Um, a man named Dave Setti or Sadie, depending on who you ask, finally took time to look into my permitting. It took him five minutes. We just had some stuff attached to the wrong permits. I finally got my permitting approved. I just want to stand up here and say thank you very much. It's been a war. Um, it, it just it, it just kind of sickens me that we keep hearing these stories and it keeps being this nightmare to get this process done. Um, we all bought land, we all spend money, we all pay our taxes, we all pay permits, we do everything we're supposed to do. And somehow it's just, it, it, I keep hearing these stories. Um, I really hope that, you know, I, I'm one of the lucky ones. I really hope that you guys keep listening to the citizens and we understand that, you know, some people spent some money and you know, it'd be really nice if you'd actually do what we have already permitted and paid money for. Um, that's really all I got. And again, uh, Mr. Dave Setti, I really appreciate it. You're my hero. Thank you, guys. Thank you. City Manager, did you have something at this point to say? Oh, yes, ma'am. I was going to say um, for the people who are in Activity Center 6, which we heard about, I think Ms. Placentia is the one who we talked to the most about who we informed her that we had a solution that would allow her to build her home. Um, so that is in progress and it will affect all the other ones who are here for that same reason. We do recognize that we have accountability in the situation and how it got here based on what our staff did do as far as allowing for those to want to build there, to believe that they could build there. So Director Ray in her ULDC outlines and discussions and Lori Barnes will talk about those solutions, but oh. we already have a solution in place so that they can build. And that's regarding the existing permits that have already been submitted? Correct. Okay. Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, um, Mayor, since we kind of have this agenda item to be signs and activity center six, I, I'm curious if we can just move activity center six to the beginning of this meeting instead of having these poor folks sit through the sign discussion, um, just throwing it out there to see if my fellow commissioners are amenable to that idea. Are you looking for a consensus? Well, it's it's one combined mm -hmm. agenda item, but right. if you look you want to at apart. each one of the um, backup materials, it appears signs is first and mm -hmm. activity center six is last, right. even though it's one agenda item. So we can't move an agenda item because there's only one. Mm -hmm. I'm asking if we could have the discussion, discussion on activity center six first. All right. What do we think about that? Oh, I'm an absolute yes on that. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Yeah. Good suggestion, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich, did you hear that? Hear me? Did you hear what uh, Commissioner McDowell had said about us discussing? Yes. Okay. And are you okay? I, I guess I got to wait for the screen to come up, but I'm a yes. Okay. All right. So I guess that's what we'll do. And there's no more public comment. Is that correct? Okay. So we'll move on to item two, general business 24-0590. And city manager, this is your item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is discussion of possible direction regarding one, the draft of the United Land Development Code, Chapter 5, sign regulations and discussion, and two, possible direction regarding the single family development in activity center six, Yorkshire. And we have our Assistant Director of Development Services, Ms. Lori Barnes, here to present. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Lori Barnes, Assistant Director of Development Services. 
Uh, regarding Activity Center 6, um, in light of the issues presented by the residents here today, we wanted to bring a consideration forward to the City Commission as to possible solutions to address the issues that have arised due to lack of training and errors on the behalf of our zoning staff in the past. Uh, when Elena Ray and I came here um, two years and a little bit more than two years from now, uh, we were advised immediately by the planning staff that single family homes were not permitted in Activity Center 6. Now on your screen, you see policy 2.18. 2.18 in the comprehensive plan called for all of the properties in the activity centers to be rezoned to a planned community development zoning district. <coughs> Unfortunately, after adoption of these policies and the creation of the activity center six, six and others, the zoning did not move forward as intended for all of these areas. Now, Activity Center 6 has been contemplated in the Comprehensive Plan since 2002. In 2002, the Comprehensive Plan did not identify any specific percentages or uses of the land. However, in 2008, the Activity Center table clearly depicts that in Activity Center 6, no low-density residential was contemplated or permissible in that Activity Center. Yet the activity center boundary in 2008 did include the area to the south of I-75, despite the fact that that land remained RSF2 single family zoning. Under the current comprehensive plan, the percentage allocations for uses of land remain as they were in 2008 with no low density allocation provided for in Activity Center 6. The interim guidelines for Activity Center 6 similarly do not reflect low density residential development. The Unified Land Development Code calls out that Activity Center 6 shall be rezoned to comply with the city's comprehensive plan yet the past administration never proceeded with that rezoning. This is the current boundary of Activity Center 6, again showing north and south of I-75 in the Yorkshire and Raintree area as Activity Center 6 future land use. Interestingly enough, on the north side, of I-75, some rezonings did occur. However, the property was not rezoned to planned community development. It was rezoned to commercial, um, to medium density residential, and to government uses as well as high density residential. Uh, the area where we are seeing the most concern is on the south side of I-75, where some homes were issued permits in the past uh, due to an inconsistency in the application of our regulations. This is not an interpretation. The state law is very clear that comprehensive plan policies supersede unified land development policies and zoning if they conflict. <clears throat> in this case, they do conflict. Therefore, the comprehensive plan policies rule for these properties despite their zoning designation. Uh, this area of Dalewood Circle is the area where most of these homes were permitted in conflict with the comprehensive plan provisions. Of the three options staff provided, two of these options would provide some relief to the property owners you've heard from today. Uh, the first option is to leave Activity Center 6 in its current boundary form rezone the properties to PCD as provided for in the comprehensive plan. That would not resolve the issues with these single family homeowners, but I did want to mention that um, contrary to, to some statements that were made earlier, the, the homes that are there, they are non-conforming. 
we have provisions in the new Unified Land Development Code that if a property is damaged or destroyed, they can replace it within a year, even if they are non-compliant with the current regulations. Uh, similarly, if they want to add an accessory structure, that would not be prohibited under the non-conforming provisions that we've written into the draft. Uh, option two would be to focus on that Dalewood Circle area, which has the majority of the single family homes that were permitted in error. And the third option is to allow single family homes in Activity Center 6 south of I-75 um, for the current boundary that is drawn. So staff is looking for some direction from the commission to incorporate into our comprehensive plan amendment um, that will be brought forward, we anticipate, in May. And we're happy to answer any questions that you might have, and we're um, awaiting your direction to proceed. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah. The stories that we heard today from the citizens is heart-wrenching. Is not an image I want for the city. And I applaud staff and the city manager for owning previous errors and finding solutions to fix them. This is a hardship that's been created in this general area. But who are we? And I, and I know some of you are going to be saying that I'm poking the bear here. But who are we to say one hardship is more hardship on a person than others that do not come before us? We're rezoning this entire city. And we're taking away people's dreams when they have a single family vacant lot. And in years to come, are dreaming of retiring to our city. And those vacant lots are currently zoned residential. But when we go through this rezone, they're going to be mixed use one and mixed use two. And they will not be able to build their dream home because of the rezoning. It's a prohibited use at that point. That is not an image I want today, tomorrow, or decades to come. It, it, it's inconscionable that we are taking people's property and not allowing them to develop their land that they purchased it for to build a home. Granted, some developer, some magical developer is going to come by and buy up all these properties and put some mixed use one or mixed use two on that property. But what are those property owners going to do today? What are they going to have happen today, tomorrow, five years from now? What about the property owner that lives next door to a vacant land that does get developed? Yes, I am thrilled that there are some buffers put into place for those mixed use one and mixed use twos. What about the sound? How do you regulate sound when you're within, I don't know, 30 or 40 feet of it? We have a responsibility to plan for the future, absolutely. But we also have a responsibility to protect established neighborhoods, established areas that people call their home, whether that's today, tomorrow, five years from now. I am really grateful that staff came up with the idea of anything south of 75. It's a very realistic thing. But after everything I just said, what about those poor people that are north of 75? Five years from now, 10 years from now. I came up with another idea that I would love to share. And that is, if it's a pre-platted lot that you own, that you're allowed to develop your home on it today, tomorrow, five years from now. However, if it's going to become at some point in that far off 
magical developer future, a planned community, um, maybe like an HOA type of community, no single family homes would be allowed on those. You know, because they have to join those properties together. Whereas a single family lot is usually 80 by 120. So, so that would be an option for I would love to discuss further with my fellow commissioners and my staff. But please do not lose sight that what we fix in Activity Center 6 is going to rear its ugly head in any zoning district that gets changed from single family residential to mixed use one or mixed use two. It's not an image I want for our city in the future. And I do not envy the, the wrath of future commissions when citizens come forward with similar stories today that they purchased their property and they can't develop on it. It's a hardship. Nobody's hardship is worse or better than somebody else's. How do you equate a hardship? It's still a hardship. I yield. Look forward to the conversation. All right, thank you. Vice Mayor. Well, tough to follow there, Commissioner McBell. You know, uh, I concur. I'm glad to see that the city has, you know, an approach to handling those folks who have already submitted uh, permits here. Um, you know, the idea of being able to replace or repair a home within one year. I mean, the reality is it can take God knows how much longer than that to get insurance claims. God forbid anything happens. The reality is that um, I fall somewhere in the middle here. My belief is that in, in this area where people have submitted permits, these couple of neighborhoods that you know are at issue, I mean, the city clearly made a mistake and People are suffering for it. They should not have to suffer for it. They should be entitled to build their homes. They should be entitled to enjoy their dream. Certainly, they should not incur any financial hardship as a result of this. And, mm -hmm. and the city should make sure that they're allowed to move forward and lift the permit restrictions and get this out of the way so they can move forward. As far as the other areas, the, the philosophical discussion here of rezoning, the reality is general development platted this entire city as single family. So the thought that we can as a city rezone just doesn't make sense. The inability for this city to finance its growth is apparent more and more every day. With less than 10% non-residential tax revenue, it's absurd to think that this city can continue without doubling and tripling its property tax rates, which is gonna push a significant portion of the people in this city out because they won't be able to afford to live here. We have to be able to do this. And it's been a slow, thoughtful, methodical process. There has been consideration as each portion of this rewrite has come forward. People have raised concerns over neighborhoods, areas, and those have been addressed in a sincere, sensitive way. Not everybody got their way. Compromises were made. And this is a living document. There will be, as we move forward, continual modifications and tweaks to accommodate, to be humane, to be understanding. But the thought that we should not do this that we can't rezone in order to blend this city properly so we can have a balanced tax base so people can afford to live here, it's just, it's not realistic. It's a great thing to stand on a soapbox and say, you know, but it's just not reality. I mean, the alternative to rezoning this city and doing what we need to do to balance our tax base is, you're all gonna pay two, three times in property taxes what you pay now. It's not a threat, it's just a reality can't continue. People keep moving here and single family homes cost the city a fortune to buy basic services, more than what comes in in tax revenue. Plus, you want new restaurants, you want exciting places to go. Those businesses are attracted by density and without the ability to create some diversity of housing types, we don't attract those businesses and people wonder why we get 
you know, everything moves south or north of us. And, and there's a lot more here that meets the eye. So by all means, this city intends to be compassionate, I believe, and future commissions will be with regard to problems that arise and they can be dealt with. But, you know, I'm not for taking a big swatch of Activity Center 6 and, and making it residential. That was never the intent. Problem was people were allowed and under the belief that they could move into Activity Center 6, build their dream homes. And that was a mistake on the part of the city. And it should be rectified by allowing these people to build. The slippery slope on this is you'll have to appreciate that as Activity Center 6 grows and eventually a Yorkshire, you know, uh, uh, um, interchange goes in there and an exit goes in there, I mean, you're going to be surrounded by non-residential development. That is a choice you shall make, but you should be entitled to make it. And you should be entitled to enjoy your home now because who knows how many years it'll be before that ever happens. So that's all I have to say. Um, um, I'm glad the city's doing something to address these fine folks because boy, oh boy, I'd be bouncing off the walls if, if I was in any of their positions. And so it's time to just like get this rectified so they can move forward. So there we go. All right, thank you. Thank Do you, you have a preference for any one of those options? I uh, believe it was option two. Okay. okay. That's the Dalewood Circle area. Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Langdon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a few questions first for Ms. Barnes. Um, how much residential development is there currently, and how many building permits? have been pulled and approved on the other side of 75? I guess that's either east or north, right. depending okay. on. Um, on the north side of 75, within the <coughs> activity center, we are not aware of any. As I mentioned, one in, one in two family zoning doesn't exist on the north side <coughs> of 75. On the south side of I-75, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15, I believe, are are existing and we are aware of a handful of permits that have been put on hold since um, on the south side on the south side since the discovery of the inconsistency between the land use and the zoning and the errors of the land reviewing staff were identified um, if we were to carve out or al allow that residential development to proceed on the south side, do we have any opportunity to expand the activity center on the north side or the south side in a way that wouldn't impact any other residential activity? We, we are already planning for an expansion of Activity Center 6 mm -hmm. um, under the Comprehensive Plan Amendment and the new zoning, mm -hmm. um, as well as adding Activity Center 10. Mm -hmm. um, right. So as far as a percentage of loss of non-residential, we have not run those numbers. And what it looks like at the bottom line, does it bring us in at... 17%, 18%, do we slip down to 16 by removing this? Um, you know, if the commission gives us some direction to proceed when we bring this back, we'll have those percentages and the comparison between um, how it exists as proposed today and, and how the figures, the percentages would be impacted by leaving this south side to single family. So um, recommendation two is just the Dellwood area. How much residential activity exists, either built homes or homes in progress, south of 75 but outside of Dellwood? If we could have the screen put up, please. Yeah, I would like to see those yeah. options again. I did not print out the presentation. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. Thank you. So just to clarify, the star is Galewood, correct? Am I reading that right? Okay. So the star is. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, so on your screen, in, in this area, there's about 400 lots. There's one home that was built in 2002, oh, 2006. Um, this is the Dalewood Drive area, and you can see there are a number of homes, um, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15. There's more. There's, there's more. Um, this area, um, there may be one home. This area, um, as you are aware, um, there are probably six homes in this area. This area, the turkey leg that everybody refers to, we actually removed that from the proposed activity center six expansion boundary because of the number of homes that were existing there. Um, as far as permits that have been applied for and stopped in the process, um, Elena believed it was two, um, so a handful or less. Okay. And looking at these boundaries, if we look at the southernmost section of the boundary, is there opportunity and what would the impact be of expanding the boundary toward Rain Tree? And also that other, it's not a turkey leg, it's, I don't know what it is, an omelet. Right. Um, that little neighborhood right actually, to the south. If Southwest. Now I can't pull it up. Um, so we we are bringing activity center um, activity center ten mm -hmm. to the boundary of activity center six. Yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at that. So right. If you could review it, I'd appreciate it. Right. And. I'm, <clears throat> Yes. It will take some time for us to be able to populate that map for you. Um, if you'd like me to do so, I can, I can pull up the proposed activity center map, but it will take a few minutes. Do you want to put it on the overhead? I printed it out. I just need it back for our discussion, please. That's, that's the one we last talked about. Doesn't show any other changes that may have been made <coughs> after our last discussion. So activity center, yes, activity center 10 um, does come up to the existing boundary of activity center six. And I can show you on here. So activity center 10 comes up to the existing boundary of activity center six. It comes along East Price Boulevard. Your arm is, Your arm is covering it. Uh, comes along East Price Boulevard um, to North York Shire Street and then down to Hillsboro. You can, there you go. Thank there you go. Okay, so activity center six boundary here. Yep. X, the proposed activity center 10 comes up to the AC6 boundary as it exists today. Loops around along Price and comes up to Yorkshire before returning down to Hillsborough. So we have captured a significant amount of acreage in the proposed activity center 10. Mm -hmm. And again, the percentages and what percent change we'd be seeing, unfortunately, I don't have prepared for you today. But if you were to give us direction when we bring the comprehensive plan amendment back, we can show you the differences that result from removing some of that area from the commercial um, acreage. Thank you for that, Ms. Barnes. Um, wow. I, I won't be repetitive. I do concur with um, 
Vice Mayor Stokes's comments, but um, I, I feel the need to reiterate, if this city does not expand its commercial footprint, we face, and I was sort of thinking it was 15 and 20 years from now, it, it's, it's now, <laughs> we are facing the inability to balance our budget and take care of the safety and infrastructure needs of this city under our current situation. And, and there are many facets to it, but I, I just feel compelled to say publicly, the rezoning of this city is essential. <coughs> all we all face, and not 15 years from now, but much more immediate, the need to dramatically increase impact fees that no one up here wants to do, and or, and probably and, seriously cut services, safety services, infrastructure repairs, this city will not be a wonderful place to live if we don't address our shortfalls. And again, it's multifaceted. Zoning addresses just one piece of the puzzle. And it's so essential. I mean, we really need to balance, you know, the needs of our residents with our need to be able to generate sufficient revenue to continue to be a safe community and to be able to maintain our infrastructure. We all saw what happened after Ian, and we have aging infrastructure, and, and we've begun to address some of it. It's expensive to do that. The city is doing everything it can to get grants and state money and federal money. We're not leaving that stone unturned, but we need to face facts. And, and we're gonna have to make some decisions that are painful for all of us, perhaps some more than others. If you're living on a major arterial road, that's where the rezoning is focused. And if you step back and look at it, that's where higher density development belongs. Um, so I, I also understand that the city made some very serious mistakes in the past and people have committed money and have built homes or are in the process of building homes. We need to correct that. And, and again, both of my commissioners um, on either side of me have already complimented staff. And I want to add to that, you've come up with some reasonable, balanced ways of, of handling it. So I'm, I, I can't bring the three, if you could bring the three <clears throat> directions up. I have a cranky iPad here and I'm not able to pull it up. There we go. So I guess um, option two is sort of a carve out. Is it the intention with that, that anyone who has pulled a permit and had a permit approved can proceed or the whole area would proceed with residential development? What's the intention of that? The, the intention of that is to allow any property in the Dalewood <laughs> Circle area um, identified by certain blocks and mm -hmm to construct a single family home moving forward, mm -hmm. rather than identifying only those that are in the permitting process. Mm -hmm. we, we cannot be sure how many people may be in the process of having their plans drawn, who may have had their properties surveyed, um, who may be preparing for permitting, right. which is why we didn't want to focus simply on those who were held up in the building permit process. OK. Um. So I'm, I'm thinking my preference would be if we can identify those who are in process, I'm more inclined to say um, anyone who has pulled a permit can proceed. Um, I, I'm uncomfortable carving out this one area because there are residential structures outside of this area on the south side of 75. Um, and I do believe it's unfair to, 
to those folks to be treated differently. So I think we need to come up with something that is fair to everybody who is living in this area. Um, however, I just don't think this city can afford to give up that entire area. So I, I think we need to do some due diligence and, and maybe it's reaching out just to the folks in this area, identifying anyone who is proceeding, even if they haven't pulled a permit. I can tell you have something to say, Director. Mm -hmm. Right. Could we pull up the, um, could you pull up the, the map again? You want the, this the map? Aerial, no, the aerial, no, I'm sorry, just the aerial, I'm sorry. So we have one in this area okay. that is on hold. Oh, it's on hold. That's we not heard from them today. It's on okay. hold. You heard from them today. Okay. So if you if you only include Dalewood Circle, you will not address one of the people who you heard from today. Um, I will say that the the only the only areas south of seventy five where we have not received any inquiries are these two areas here, the ones right along Yorkshire. Right. Um, while I I agree that this is a large area to give up, it's a bit locked in with canals. Um, same for this. You have Delwood has the R ditch here. You have the same with the Barcelona area. But this area along North, North Yorkshire, while it um <laughs> It, it's it's in the same situation from the previous rezone or non zoning. It's along Yorkshire. It's a, <coughs> that area. I, I cannot even imagine having a home on the exit ramp of right. seventy five right. and Yorkshire uh, at some point in the future. Um, those two pockets, I think, would make sense to. Um, Retain or to be zoned activity center because they will get a lot of traffic. Um, but the these other areas, while there's only one home here, there is somebody in a situation that they did invest based on what the zoning was. Mm -hmm. This entire area was done at a service twenty almost twenty years ago when it was not rezoned. There's just no other way mm -hmm. of saying that. Um, but these areas along here, and likely because they are along Yorkshire, and most a lot of people know that there will be an intersection at this location. And also at Raintree. I mean, at Raintree as well. And that's entrance. outside. Right. That is outside of this this boundary. But of inside activity 10, center. correct? It is inside 10. So okay. we've planned for that. But I might suggest a, a fourth compromise is to lead, put this area right around, right along Yorkshire as activity center six and using the rest of it or leave the, the zoning as residential. Um, if I may, um, alternatively, we could leave the activity or place the activity center six zoning allow for single family homes as a permissible use in that area. And then as the, as, as the area grows mm -hmm. in non-residential uses, when the interchange comes through, there might be opportunities for redevelopment of that area. And as much as a developer could come in and purchase a large number of lots, um, buy people out of their homes, demo and redevelop as non-residential. So, you know, we do have several options, either revert back to single family zoning, leave the activity center zoning as proposed, but allow single family only in those areas. So the two areas, so not along Yorkshire, but the out, sort of the outer areas, the starred area and to the south of it, mm -hmm. okay. 
from that here. And that, then to the north. And what that would do, um, as Ms. Barnes described, what that would do is allow potential for redevelopment at some point in the future without having to rezone. So if somebody wants to build their single family home now, 20 years from now, a developer comes in and wants to buy the entire neighborhood, which has happened in places, they, they would have the option to sell for that. One more question. Um, I'm assuming, and that's always risky, that the zoning all along Yorkshire, well, let me ask it as a question. As we get out of the activity center designation and go down Yorkshire, York, Yorkshire, what's the zoning on either side of Yorkshire under the new proposal? It would be AC-10. It would be? One side. Yes. On one side? On, one, on, the, on the south side. Okay. The east side of Yorkshire would be AC-10. Do you want the map back? Yes, please. Single family is on the west side of Yorkshire. So yes, you could sing, put that single back up for everybody. Single family on the um, west side of Yorkshire. No, the, the map you're looking at, so everybody can see it, please, ma'am. I can't do that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but everything. Let me just do this. Everything on the. There we go. There we go. Push it toward the iPad. There we the go. Laptop. Thank you. So where this brown line meets the yellow. That is Yorkshire. Okay. The Yorkshire makes that boundary. And on the west side would be single family, and on the east side would be um, Activity Center 10. And, and primarily that's due to um, a lot of the development that's taken place west of Yorkshire and providing that buffer um, along I would that, just comment, and order. it is outside of the scope of this conversation. It is. But Yorkshire is going to be a major uh, thoroughfare with a lot of commercial traffic. Right. And none I, of those I'd be lots tempted would, to bite yeah. the bullet and look at the east side of Yorkshire. Um, but in, it's beyond, that's beyond today's right. conversation. And we have to draw the lines somewhere. somewhere. And yeah. um, so we look at the development that's already in the area. We look at um, <coughs> transitional uses um, that would... Um, provide sort of a step down buffer, right. you know, between certain uses. Right. Um, so th those are kind of the driving factors on that. Um, I'm inclined at this point to support the second option. However, I do have a concern. We don't have the analysis yet of, you know, what do we lose in terms of commercial footprint giving that up? What do we gain in other places? So, um, um, based on today's information, I would support option two, um, but I'll have a concern about where we stand in terms of our commercial footprint. I yield. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commis Commissioner Emmerich, are you there? Unmute, Commissioner. Probably gotta get I am unmuted. Screen. You got to put, there you go. Apparently, it's not working unless you can see me Mr. bright Emmerich, and bold. are you there? Can you hear me now? Okay, there you are. Yep. This this is so aggravating, and I apologize, Sorry. but I think you got to wait for the screen to come up before you can hear me. My Everything's on here, so we'll get through it. Um, mm. I just heard all the discussions and stuff, and this is one discussion from the very beginning that I did not want to have to have, is people working their whole lives to come down here and have their dream home built for you just say, nope, it's been rezoned. We're taking that dream away from you. So I agree wholeheartedly with Commissioner McDowell and her statements as she stated earlier. And I've met with some of these individuals that are saying that their permits are on hold because of this, because of that. I thank staff very much for going in and seeing that we have made an error. We're willing to fix the area error and move forward my situation on what i was thinking of off the top of my head before you came up with all of the solutions that you came up with which are great was to allow the building to completely go on with the 
uh, with the homes because of the fact is, is, hey, we don't know if they're ready to go build now or if they're in the process now. If you let somebody build now, why aren't you going to let somebody build three years from now when they retire? It's, it's just a heavy, heavy dilemma on what we're trying to do out in that area. You know, people have come and said, hey, my, build, my permit's been held up because of this rezoning. And, and, and I feel for them. I really do. I would have opted for option three until I seen how everything was mapped out. And I agree that the Yorkshire area on the south end should go with the north end to be commercial. So I would cut out those three little areas, you know, the one to the left, the start area, and the one to the right of it, and then go from there commercially. But they're, they know what they're going to be building into. They know what type of atmosphere is going to be out there, what type of traffic is going to be there. But it may not be for 20 years. So we may be jumping the gun on premonitions on what's actually going to go out there. That's why I would have included single family housing on the other side as well. But it's the will of the board. And, and it would be for a, a short time. You know, if you had the northbound, okay, if you're ready to build and the next three years, you know what you're building into, that's your time limit. Time's over in three years and it's all full blown MS1 and MS2 or three or whatever you got going on out there. But that's my, my theories. I thank staff and uh, I, I guess I would be going with option two ish. Ish. Oh boy, that sounds very definite there, Commissioner Amrich. I'm yeah, it's, 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 it's I'm sorry. Yeah. Very decisive. It's one, it's one huge maybe. How about that one? Okay. But no, I, I, I'm glad we had this conversation, and I'm glad that staff is seeing it from from the hearts of the citizens. Because I, like I said, I don't want to be the one saying no when they've worked 20 years for their dream. It's that's not coming on my plate. I just so, have one very you. quick comment, if I may, Madam Mayor, before yes. you give the floor to Commissioner McDowell. Well, I wanted to say something, uh, too. Uh, may I real quick? Sure, go ahead. Um, just, I see a real difference between someone who has pulled a permit and has mm -hmm. incurred serious investment and is along that building path than someone who hasn't taken that step. Um, and I think we can come up with some other alternative, maybe for people who have surveyed but haven't yet pulled their permit. People can sell a lot, a lot more easily um, in this area than perhaps, I don't know. But I, I just see a, a big difference there. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just want to let you know I ran the numbers. Mm -hmm for you. Yeah. If we remove the Delwood Circle area, the area to the south, and the area to the north of Yorkshire left, the area that Elena was Yorkshire focusing runs. on. Did we get this? Well, Yorkshire runs north and south. So when you say north of Yorkshire, you're not helping us. <laughs> yes, I understand. I'm still I'm still I'm still working my head around I-75 running east and west yeah. through the city. It's it's new for me. <laughs> so um so if we could get, could get the screen up. The, there we go. The other the PowerPoint. The aerial. Thank Aerial. You. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you remove the Delwood Circle area and the neighborhood adjacent, and then this neighborhood, you would, for non-residential percentages in activity center, for non-residential percentages across the board throughout the city, you would be going from 16.91% to 16.38%. Okay, those numbers again, please. Under the draft, you would you would be going from 16.91% non-residential to 16.38% if you were to remove or if you were to allow single family residential in those particular neighborhoods we just pointed out. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, confirm that all of the permits except that one or in the Dalewood area. That's what you said, correct, Ms. Barnes? And then there's only one in the outlying? That we are aware of, correct. Okay. And that those could be 
we could say, let's go forward with those and pull, and essentially pulling those out and giving them like a special. We cannot. Oh. We cannot. Um, the commission will need to give us direction to incorporate one of these proposed solutions in the comprehensive plan amendment that's coming before you. Oh. Um, we cannot approve a permit that proposes a use that is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. It is against the Florida statutes. Right. It's against the law. So we need to get a comprehensive plan amendment processed as soon as humanly possible, right. um, which we we have the draft for the ULDC rewrite associated changes, um, essentially ready to come before you. We're hoping for May. We're awaiting the word from our outside legal counsel that they've completed their review. Um, so we can incorporate whatever changes you would direct us to today regarding this area. Okay bring it to the commission, transmit it to the state. It may take three months in total for us to complete that comprehensive plan amendment. We just simply have no mechanism to release a permit that is in conflict with state law. Okay, so that would that's what you're talking about. One of the options is the entire Dalewood Circle area. But we talked today about, you did say that the, those who have submitted and are in the process, they would be permitted to go forward without the comp plan amendment or no? No, ma'am. They are on hold, are until, on hold until the comp plan. They're on hold until we make this decision. Is right. that what it is? Yes, okay. until and we, the comp plan gets approved. And we cannot pull out one house from that area. Right. And it would have to Doing be that whole otherwise, area. That's I what mean, you're saying. It, it's one thing for mistakes to, to have been made in the past when someone who was signing that permit didn't know what right. they were supposed to be looking for to knowingly issue a permit in violation, and there's plenty of okay. record now that says we would be, um, that's a different matter. That's that's knowingly, right. consciously violating state law. So I guess my next next question is then, would these people have to wait until that complaint yes, amendment goes to? Yes, that's what I thought. Okay. And then um, this area, the way it's zoned, as we said, for, for higher density development, how would... I guess now they know that they're they're aware that that could be, take place there. But if if we do make that comp plan amendment for that entire area, you're going to still be getting people make submitting applications that they can build a house in that little section. Correct? How, how would they be aware that they are living in an area now that is going to experience high density development? I know Commissioner Emmerich said they know now. Well, that's apparently not the case because these people didn't really know that this area was going to happen. So, so with, with the ULDC rewrite and the comp plan amendments that will be coming before you, the zoning here would be for activity center six. Um, the comprehensive plan references the future interchange, um, the collector distributor interchange at Yorkshire and Raintree. So the comprehensive plan document will reflect the intent for high density in this area as well as that future interchange. If the zoning is if the zoning goes forward as an activity center six that allows single family only in these areas, right. then it will be clear that there are higher intensity uses and higher density and intensity developments that can occur in activity center six. And that will be available in the ULDC for those who have property there and are considering a single family home. Okay. Um, so that would that would show up when they go and go on the, the tax collector's site, because that's what I've been hearing that when they went to look up, it said RF mm -hmm. one or two, and they had no idea. But that you're saying that would be very definitely stated on there that this is zoned for right high, okay. and when you think about it, that's why we really haven't had this problem north of 75 because that land was zoned not in addition to the comp plan being changed mm. to activity center six that land was zoned planned community development mm. or i'm sorry it was zoned some commercial it should have been zoned mm -hmm. pcd at mm. that time uh because the comp plan says that all of the activity centers should be zoned pcd Instead, it was zoned commercial and some higher residential uses and some industrial. But um, 
but because the tax the, the property appraiser's office shows those zoning mm -hmm. districts other than residential, we haven't had that issue. Um, it's the conflict south of 75 that sets us up for this situation. Okay. So that um, we were talking about Dalewood, but also that other area, that little block, there's one one house in the queue that's right. been on that hold. that area, yes. So um, if we were to include that in, okay, this is going to be considered for um, uh, single-family homes, that means someone can come in, buy up, the other lots and put whatever those permitted uses are if we have that comp plan amendment, which right. would include, I don't know, multifamily or something else. Right. All right. Because I, I just anticipate, again, like we're going through the rezoning process, that somebody said, I don't want a, an apartment building next to me, but this is what could possibly happen in this area. And that's what I'm just concerned about, that people are aware of that when they go to buy a undeveloped lot and we made this change. That is a possibility. Correct. And okay. they would they would have to comply with all of the <coughs> buffers and open space and, and right. transition buffering. Right. Yes. But I'm just trying to avoid what we're hearing now is we didn't mm -hmm. know we, we we built this because we thought this was just residential and now we're considering these rezoning areas and that's what I'm hearing again from people. But um, I just was trying to avoid that happening again down the line. Um, so I think that's that's all of me. I'm I'm inclined to go with option two, but also you said, I mentioned we would have to include that other little area as well. So it wouldn't just be the Dalewood Circle area for option two anymore, correct? We'd we, be looking at Dalewood where the star is, yes. the area to the south of Dalewood, mm -hmm. or and then the Barcelona area at the very north of it. All right, but that would be the entire area. No, there'd be still York. The area is right sure. on either side of Yorkshire. Oh, okay. Would okay. be retained. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, respectfully, staff, anything north of I-75 in the Yorkshire Activity Center 6 is zoned, according to the property appraisers, a single-family residential. I, can pull I, I just up the looked on there and... So I'm just letting you know, I just looked I can there. tell you that it is not zoned single family. There are some areas that are, but Activity Center 6 mm -hmm. is not zoned. And we can pull up the zoning map. I, and, and I'm just letting you know. I can't you know. help what the property appraiser says, but I can tell you what our zoning map this says. This is part of the problem when, to what Mayor was saying, is if the property appraiser's website is not showing the accurate zoning, that is a huge problem for our city of Northport because property owners that own vacant property are ready to go and develop their property. They're going to the property appraisers. It shows single family residential. Our zoning map may show that it's commercial. Our zoning map may show that it's government or whatever our zoning map says. But if the property appraisers website is showing it single family residential, that's a huge problem. That would be a huge problem. I'd have okay. to look at so, specific properties to see. I just pulled up six of them during that conversation, just pick and choose. Were okay. you looking at our zoning map to see if the zoning was commercial? Or it's in, I'm looking at the property appraiser's website. Anyhow, a side note, we as a city do, there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes prior to a person that wants to develop property to come before the city for a permit. They sit around their kitchen table. Hey, I'm fixing to retire. Hey, now we get to build our, our dream home on that piece of property. Hey, let's, let's start looking at developers and builders. And hey, let's start doing whatever our due diligence is. And then we spend those thousands and thousands of dollars at the kitchen table getting ready to put the plan in place and working with that builder and that builder then comes before the city and says, nope, you can't build that. It's, it, it goes back to this is fundamentally, and yes, I understand that it's a philosophical difference. And I am going to advocate for my philosophical difference because I have talked to hundreds of citizens that are in this boat and are planning. That's why they bought the vacant property. That's why they bought it. 
to build a home on. So we have to be cognizant of that. The other thing is, is there are many people in act the proposed new activity center 10 that I have also met with that are in the process, whether it's a kitchen table type of process or whether it is actually going through the steps to get the building permit completed that are in activity center six and uh, activity center 10 that are planning to build their home in that area. And, and to just say, hey, we're going to do Barcelona, Hampshire and Dalewood, that's fantastic for those people. What about everybody else? What about everyone else? I'm sorry, the city of Northport has known that they have these single family pre platted lots for over almost 65 years. This is not new. If we want to increase our tax base, focus on the activity centers. These are, <coughs> we have to figure out what we're doing with activity center 10. And the people that have the permits pulled are, are at their kitchen table planning for their future. Um, we can't just focus on these three areas because these three areas, yes, these are specific to the public commenters that came before us today. And my heart breaks for what they're going through. But there are hundreds of other people that are going through it in some step or some phase along the process. I'm advocating for them. This is not just my philosophical difference with my fellow commissioners. This is what I have been hearing from the citizens that I meet with and have reached out to me. And we have to be respectful of what they're doing too and what they're going through and what their plans are. You're <coughs> taking their property. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, uh, the task at hand is Activity Center 6, though. So. Um, so and I understand that that's the problem that, with that. that. I understand yeah. this is an issue with Activity Center 6, right. and that's what we're here for. This, but this. I am reminding everybody we cannot lose sight of the situation right. that we but are that's, also that's creating in 10. And this is complex enough for me anyway, <laughs> as it is, without bringing all that up into the mix. Vice Mayor? Yes. Just to, to roll back a little and just try to better understand, away from the slide, um, the folks who have applications in, permits in, requests in, that are on hold, am, am I understanding correctly that they are not going to be able to move forward until a comp plan change takes place? That is correct. There's no way, any way on this earth <laughs> it can be done, anything can be done to expedite. Not without myself and my staff knowingly violating Florida law. And we are ethically bound by our licenses not to do that, or anybody, anybody, not just a resident of the city, anybody can take us to our respective licensing boards and have our licenses revoked. That's our profession, that, that's our professional so livelihood. So we got a period of months, so we got to deal with that. The big difference here is that back in the mid-2000s, the city did not follow through on what it should have done. That's the big difference with this part of Activity Center 6. It did, and, and that's the big difference between Activity Center 6 and the single family zoning in proposed Activity Center 10. There is a difference. In Florida, buying property and sitting on it does not grant you any vested rights. That's been through courts, it's been through, it's been to the Supreme Court. There is no vesting in buying a property doesn't matter what the zoning is. That would mean that cities and counties could never plan for the future <coughs> and could never change things based on the needs of the community as a whole. So there is no vesting to simply buying a property. You, are, you have no vested rights. Vesting includes pursuing some type of development order, whether it be a permit, you've submitted an application for development in some way, that is what vesting is. Once somebody has submitted the permit, then they obtain vesting. Um, or if they submit um, any type of development application, they have at that point pursued development. 
under the state statutes. And the only other question I have is, might it not be an option here since within this basically three section designation south south of i guess it's south of um except for right along yorkshire is it realistic i'd be interested in staff's perspective on actually being proactive with this particular area in terms of reaching out to property owners who we may not have heard from, who may not have this on their radar within this little area here so that we give them every possible benefit of the doubt to let them know if we're going to allow residential here to let them know what's coming. I mean, uh, but I guess, well, maybe I'm wrong. If we if we allow single family in there, then we don't really have to worry about it, do we? Right. Okay. Then I'm good. Right. And and thank you for uh, defining what vesting right. means. Right. Right. At this point, we're simply addressing an error that was made in 2008 and fixing that error as best we can. I mean, we can't go back and there have been permits denied over the last 15 years. Not every permit that was submitted was approved. Mm -hmm. um, there were people that came in and talked to planning, and planning said, you can't build there, so they never submitted a permit. So we can't fix everything, but it's a, it's a reasonable solution to fixing this problem and going forward to, to ease the burden on, on the people who have started this process. And, and just to finish up with my comments, as you know, in addressing somewhat to Mr. McDowell's perspective on this, and, and, and I do get it, and, and you can't invalidate the fact that, that for folks who have acquired property, whether or not they have taken any action or vested, you know, there in their mind somewhere is a perspective on what might happen here. My my belief is that as as this whole ULDC comes back to us in, in, in its totality to look at and rule on, we can have these kinds of discussions. I would hope staff could provide us with the realities of what happens if we if we don't rewrite this. If if we don't make these changes, you know, people I believe really need to understand how much more they're going to be paying. So that wonderful dream of building their dream house from a comp plan and zoning perspective may be allowable if we don't rewrite this ULDC. The cost of living here will be so prohibitive that they won't be able to live here anyway or build this home. And I think people got to get it. I heard you reference that when you were talking about what the impact to the non-residential tax base might be if we fiddled around with this a little and we're still talking 15 16 ish percent sustainability in most cities our size and larger are 20 to 30 percent non-residential let's not forget that even with all these zoning changes <coughs> this city is going to face some serious challenges so you know it's it, it, when five, 10, 15 years comes from now and the citizens of the city are saying, we can't afford to live here anymore. We're paying three times what they did in 2024 for property taxes. They're gonna go, what in God's name were the people who were running this city thinking when they did this? And so, you know, there's a trade-off and, and I can't beat this drum hard enough. I get it. But the reality is, pay me now, pay me later. Maybe we should just scrap the whole you this day and, you know, just triple the millage rate. And then we'll have revenues, which is an absurd idea. So we have to move forward on this thing. We got to be humane. We got to be sensitive. We got to try to tweak it. This is still a living document and will be. But this is an inevitability in order to make this city sustainable. It just is. And, and, and I get the other aspects of it, but there's it's, it's just no two ways about the direction this city has to go. And it has ignored this for a long time. 
This is not an easy subject, but it would have been solved a long time ago. We're on the right track. We've devoted enormous time conversation. This is certainly not being done anywhere outside to sunshine. The whole bloody world knows. Anyone who doesn't know what's going on here doesn't want to know. So, Thank uh, you. Vice Mayor, I think you raised some very excellent points. And I will say that our, our sister pre-platted communities mm -hmm. did this many years ago. We are, we are on the tail end. Right. We, Northport should have done this 20 years ago. A um, lot less painful. <laughs> should have done it when our, when our other sister cities did the same thing. But I'll also say it's not just the financial cliff that we're looking at. Every house that's built out here is built on well and septic. The EP is watching the city very closely. And at some point, they are going to shut us down and say no more septics, yep. period. It's coming. And would we rather plan for that and know and, and start to convert these uses so that we have non-residential developers who pay to extend the utilities out to this area? Or do we wait until the DEP shuts us down and we have no choice but to um, pay Billions. To extend it on the city and and all exactly. the other ta taxpayers, that's that's what we are seriously looking at. It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. Thank you, Miss Lynn. All right, yeah, thank you. And <clears throat> by sister cities, you're referring to the other general development. Correct. So, there yeah. are about eight um, right. other cities, and they have they have done this mm -hmm. many years ago. Um, and they and also it was bought land. It was a lot of <laughs> land. It was painful then. Um, there's there's no other way to do it. it right. At some point, you have to make the change, and um, you know, in order to be fi fiscally stable, it just has to be done. Okay. So I just want to uh, have to hear from Commissioner McDowell and and Commissioner Emmerich again, but we're going to be moving towards giving direction to staff. What? So keep that in mind. Please. Just, okay. That's what we're <laughs> we're here for. Um, do that, plus we have to call for public comment on this, so don't let me forget that. So, Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, I just have a follow-up question. Um, you were talking about vested rights, and then what was the other right that you mentioned? I didn't catch the terminology. You said vested rights and something else. Well, there, there's a vested right. Mm -hmm. um, you have to um, file for or pursue a development. And that can take several forms. It can be a building permit. It can be um, a um, variance. variance it can be a special exception. It can be a development order through. Uh, and what is that called? I'm sorry. You, you used a different term. Entitlement. Entitlement. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. it. Okay. So if I'm hearing correctly, a vested right is where. Nobody has any rights to the property that they're purchasing. That a, a vested right means that somebody has the right to do to build something. Okay, <clears throat> when you buy a piece of property, you really have what it means is you in Florida you don't have a vested <clears throat> right to do anything on that property until you pursue development. So, with that said. If I am an investor and I invested in an area that's commercial property, but because I only purchase the property as commercial property, I have no vested right if that property changes zoning to, let's say, residential. So, Because that's a bird Harris now. So in Florida, you can't, you can't reduce the use of a property below its current usage. Where well, I wanted okay. you to go with that. <laughs> so you can you can rezone residential to mixed use or commercial because in land use terms and, and <coughs> appraisal and everything else, those are higher and better uses of the property or they expand the uses of the property. And and I understand that, but when you left everything kind of like in limbo that there's no vested rights when you purchase the property, I wanted you to expand on that so that everybody understood the right. rest right. of the story. So you so couldn't, you. for instance, take a, we hear a lot of times, well, rezone that property to a park. Right. You can't do that because that's lowering the value 
and the usage I of a property. Just wanted you to expand on it. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Emrich, did you have anything final comment or anything else? Yes, ma'am. Can you see me? Yes. yes. Thank you. All right, you can see me and hear me. Yep. yep. Um, we're just. I, I know this is for another discussion, but what the vice mayor brought up about uh, losing, you know, our commercial status there of trying to get to 18%. I believe the numbers earlier, uh, what was stated on this was we would be at like a 16.8. And by carving <coughs> out these little entity pockets, it would only drop us down to 16.3 something. Am I correct on that? Ms. Yes, Barnes? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, close enough. 16.91 to 16.38. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's almost a half a percentage is, is that's, I just wanted to get that out of there. We're going to give up a half a percentage for being humane, for helping the people that are already trying to build their homes. And this, this doesn't even take into consideration because I don't believe we've had any numbers going with, uh, uh, the area 10. So what, 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 what calculations would that bring us commercially? We haven't discussed it. That's another discussion, but we're giving up a half a percent here or, you know, it's to me, to, to me, it's, it's, it, we, we, yeah, we should have done this 20 years ago. Okay. We wouldn't have had this problem now, but we have population, we have people, we have families, and this is our problem now. How are we going to face it? Are we going to face it with greed? Or are we going to face it with humanity? Thank you, Coach. We need to make peace and do it the right way. So that's all I had. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're going to move to public comment on this. Do we have any? I won't take that long been a lengthy discussion. I just wanted to go back and let you know, I drove these three areas last week. There's 39 homes in the Dalewood Circle, if, if I could have that re-upped. Um, there's three building permits on hold that I know of. There's 29 homes in the Barcelona Circle area that are already established, and I haven't researched any building permits, if that's on there. In the Hampshire circle, there's one established home and a building permit on home, uh, on hold. I want to let you know that there is no AC6 proposed structures that will fit on these neighborhood properties now because these homes, especially in Dalewood and in Barcelona circle, are scattered throughout. They're not lined up in a row. They're scattered. So you might have two lots open here, five lots open there. And unless this land is purchased by a developer and you bulldoze these homes, there won't be anything to build. There's thousands of undeveloped acres in AC6, and, and the planning department has um, proposed additional. <coughs> and you still are going to have both sides of Yorkshire because you're proposing that big interchange there. We know that. Us uh, that are living in that area, we know that now. And we're willing to accept that. Um, I, when I was reading um, information now, this area was noted to be an employment center. And I understand there's not enough homes in Northwood or Northport to um, accommodate all these new jobs if we want to keep people. In. But you can include, if, if a developer comes in, you can include medium density in these three neighborhoods that would accommodate town. I've lived in communities where there's an apartment building in the back, there's single family homes that are split level, and then you have town homes. <coughs> you can do that, and it would fit within the character of these established neighborhoods. You don't need to redo, com commercial and industrial will not fit in these neighborhoods. They just won't. Um, so I ask even for the future of our, our employees in, in this city that they're going to be allowed an option not only to live in an apartment but to have a townhome available. We can do this. We can make this work for everybody. We can make it where you can uh, uh, 
allow for the single family homes to continue, the ones that we've pulled permits and spent thousands and thousands of dollars on what you've expected us to do. Let us do it. It's our choice if we live next to a car wash someday. <laughs> so that's our choice. But let's be rational, as Mr. <laughs> um, Emridge so rightly said. Let's be humane and allow this to move forward. You still have the availability of a special exception by a developer or a quasi-judicial. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Madam Mayor, are you looking for a consensus? consensus I sure am. I'd be Thank happy you. to uh, broach one. Go ahead. Um, I propose that we select option two, which is to allow single family homes only on certain blocks and lots in AC6, which includes the deal Dale Wood Circle area. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor, I'll start with you. <coughs> yeah, I guess I, I, I am good with that. I am good with you. That's the right way to go on this. All right, I just want to clarify, that would include not just where the star is, but it would include that portion to the right as well? Yes, and the upper left. No, well, just those two parcels well, I want to flanking clarify. your picture. Yeah. Dalewood is, is like just, a landlocked just area. Yeah, you so. said Dalewood, there's Hampshire, and then there's all the Barcelona. So, could, could we put this map, the, the PowerPoint back up? Yeah. <clears throat> I think we may have to adjust that option. Yeah. So what you would actually be looking for that consensus to accomplish what you just stated would be a modified two. Okay. okay. So that okay. it includes all it would it would allow single family on all areas in activity center six south of 75 except for the two areas right. on okay. either side of Yorkshire. Okay, that was certainly my intention with that discussion. Uh, Madam Mayor, do you want me to restate yeah. that? Did, did you get that? How to so let me, let me them? try again and then yeah. I'll check with the city clerk. Um, to allow single family homes in all areas um, in activity center six, south of Interstate 75 except for those two areas on either side of Yorkshire. Yes. Is that clear? Yes, so that would, the areas that you would be allowing the single family homes based on that consensus would be in the Barcelona area, the Dalewood Circle area, and the area uh, to, the, to the right or to the south of Dalewood Circle. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And I am definitely a yes, and so that's what I thought. <laughs> I just want to that's sure. what I thought, too, okay. I was assuming. Okay. All right, uh, I'm a yes with that. Um, so then, Commissioner Minor, you're a yes with that. Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, I need the city clerk to restate it because I heard in the consensus to allow single family homes in all areas of Activity Center 6 south of I 75 except for, and it was stated, Dalewood, Hampshire, and Barcelona. Yeah, except for. I heard, that's why I'm asking her to repeat what was said. The selected modified option two, allowing single family homes on all areas in activity center six south of I-75, except for the two areas on either side of Yorkshire Street. So you're going to allow single family homes south of 75, except for Dalewood, Hampshire, and Barcelona. No, ma'am. That's what no, she said. No, it is not. She did not. Could you please say it one more time slowly, city clerk? Select the modified option two, allowing single family homes on all areas in activity center six, south of I-75, except for the two areas on either side of Yorkshire Street. Director Ray, is that? That's correct. Could you put the map, could you put the PowerPoint back up? 
please don't get upset with me. No, when I'm, I'm hearing not something the, that you guys are saying that is different. These are the two areas, <coughs> if you look at the map, these are the two areas on either side of Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. And it's south of Price. No, it is not. This is Price. So price south of 75. 75 is further north. This is Price right here. This large black line is 75. This is Price. This bottom red line is Price Boulevard. Okay, it's I'm sorry. Price, I, I Price, thought that was Price. a waterway. Yeah, no. Okay, it's not labeled. So, so yeah, this is, is Price. I don't see it labeled, ma'am. So there's yeah. East Price. It says right here. It and says here, Price here. right here. And it says Price here. South of 75. Right. So south of 75. This is 75. Mm -hmm. Except for the two areas right. on either side of Yorkshire. This is Yorkshire. Okay. This black line here so, is Yorkshire. City Clerk, slowly, one more time, please state the consensus. To select a modified option two, allowing single family homes on all areas in Activity Center 6, south of I-75, except for the two areas on either side of Yorkshire Street. This is Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. This side and this side. So, Director, you would you would know what the comp plan amendment would be bringing back. Absolutely. That would include. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Does that yes, have to still come back for us to approve yes. it? Right. Okay. So, I am in favor of the concept of what we have been discussing. I am not in favor of carving out just that area, and I am absolutely not in favor of carving out anything else of Activity Center 6 that is single family. It's wrong. I, I feel for these citizens, and I appreciate their, their, their passion in protecting their, I said no, and I'm stating why. Okay, so you're, you're a no for that. Commissioner Emmerich, I thought I heard you say something. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yep, I'm here somewhere. <laughs> I, I would, I would be a yes to that uh, on there. I do, I do agree, and I know where I believe Commissioner McDowell's going. But if we have no activity going on on both sides of Yorkshire, then that's a streamlined nice. offense to where, where we're going to have commercial going down through there. You know, it's a boulevard. It's it's going to yeah. happen. But again, we're at twenty years, so. All right, I'm a yes, regardless. Okay, so we have a, a four to one on that consensus. All right, staff, do you, do you have what you need for that particular item? Is that good? Okay, yes, we're going to. Um, thank you for your patience, those of you that, that stayed uh, and made your comments. And uh, I'm so glad that we did move that to the beginning, yes. Not to torture you for to the sign ordinance, the, the sign thing. So we're going to take a break. How long do you want? Ten minutes. Okay. So we'll come back at ten fifty-eight. My map back. City manager, could you my map? Position. My day to day. Usually, I start out by visiting the new residents that schedule garbage and recycle containers to be delivered and I will go see them and educate them on our solid waste guidelines. More or less, I'm more focused on the recycle part of it. After that, I will drive around the city and I actually inspect recycle containers manually for contamination. And then I will take calls from drivers if there's any issues with uh, repeat garbage in the recycle and I will go educate those people as well. What I love most about the city of Northport is there are residents are from all over the world and I get to learn about the solid waste guidelines, where they come from, as well as educate them on the city of Northport's solid waste guidelines and how to recycle properly.
believe that the Natural Resources Department will be an in integral part for the city's growth as we want to achieve a more balanced approach of development in the future. What we really want to do is see sensible development, sustainable development, and development that is um, in line with what we ha already have here. So we want to preserve as much as we can of the uh, natural resources so there is still place for our natural species, our, our migrating birds, and all the other species that live um, and survive in our habitat. Natural systems are a big part of the ways ecosystems function. An important part for our community, our listed species, they stabilize the soil, they provide so many different benefits, including shade, limiting the heat island effect uh, within our city, providing habitat, providing shelter for these species, and just uh, also for our aesthetic enjoyment. Well, as an arborist, uh, a lot of what I do is making sure that development conforms to the tree protection code. So one thing we already have in place since April of 2022 is a tree protection code, which is quite robust in the city of Northport that was adopted by commission and the city through also a lot of community involvement. And so we're very happy to have that tree protection code. So what I, a lot of what I do is making sure that development either residential or commercial conforms to that code. We are such a passionate team. We come from varied backgrounds. Uh, I think between us we have over a hundred years of experience and we are every day raring to go and you know we know our work is cut out here and we're happy to uh, take the challenge. Through the division and community involvement and leadership in the city we really hope to make great strides in protecting what we have here and finding that balance with development and environmental stewardship. I am excited to be a part of this team and I'm really seeking and looking forward to the opportunities for us to be able to make a difference. As a full class, TRX Bootcamp is a new class for me, although I've been using TRX for many years uh, with personal training that I do or in other style classes that I've done. But an actual focus with just TRX, this is a new class for me. I love the camaraderie, I have to say, um, with all the participants. I think we have a lot of fun. <laughs> First of all, everyone gets to use the bands, the TRX bands, of course. <laughs> And being that we have five stations, so when we have overflow or more than five people, part of the people are on the band, the other people are doing floor work, and then we'll switch. So everybody gets an opportunity to be in all stations. Just come in, have fun with it, make it your own. It's not scary, it doesn't have to be intimidating at all. You're using your body weight, you're using the angles that you choose to use on the bands, and it just varies with how you're comfortable and how you're feeling when you're here. with Charlotte County Utilities as a meter reader in 2004. So that's kind of where I got my foot in the door. Then once I reached a point in my life where things were more stable, I decided to leave Charlotte County Utilities and I went and got my insurance license. It was very exciting doing that for a short period of time. But after a while, I started thinking about the utility. It was in my heart. At this point, I had almost 12, just two months shy of 12 years in. And so I realized during that time, my heart was in utilities. And so I started looking around again. I seen an opening here to be a CND tech. So I applied and I got in. Typically I get here at seven in the morning. I get my list of, you know, if I can get to this, this is what I need to do. And I get in my truck. If, if I need any supplies, parts, tools based off of the work I was given that morning, I'll pick that up here at our shop. And then I head out and um, 
My goal for the day is just to get as much work as that was assigned to me done as possible. And sometimes that happens, and other times there's a lot of first response calls that come in. My favorite part is the uniqueness. It's um, not knowing what I'm going to be faced with every day. It could be different. It's not mundane in any way. And it's exciting when you get a call and you're you're on your way and you don't know what it is and you you have the experience and the know-how and the backing to face whatever it's going to be so i feel very confident in facing these calls and i think that's my favorite part Frank Lamas, always manager, City of Northport. Uh, here today with Mario Vendetti, planner scheduler for the City of Northport, Solid Waste Division. We're going to talk about bulk pickups today, uh, how to schedule bulk pickups, what should go out and what should not go out to the curb, where to place the items, and then what happens if you have more than what's allotted for you for the year for a bulk pickup. So, Mario, I know we call 941 240 8050, talk to our customer service reps That's correct. about how to schedule a bulk pickup. How else can we do that? You can also go on our website, northportfl.gov, click on solid waste, and fill out a bulk request form. Excellent, excellent. So, Mario, what about uh, if a person wants to place it out, what should they place out? What's the right thing? What's the wrong thing? Basically, Frank, anything that doesn't fit in the container okay. that's garbage okay. is going to go curbside. We're going to stay off driveways. What's not accepted is tires, chemicals, okay. stuff like that. Sure. You can put yard waste out. That's considered bulk. But just make sure it's separate from the garbage pile. Okay. Yard waste yeah. is a separate pickup. So what happens if I use all my uh, bulk pickups already? Good question. Yeah. So you can have more, but you just have to pay. It's going to be sixteen fifty a cubic yard, okay. and that's length times width times height divided by 27 is one cubic yard. Any questions, of course, let us know. Give us a call, 941-240-8050. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Northport and I'm going to discuss first responders after the storm. So it may take a while for first responders to get to after the storm and that's due to a variety of reasons. One being we pull first responders off the roads when tropical storm force winds are sustained for their safety. That is a standard usually across the state and other states that have hurricanes as well. So we will have a backlog of calls that have come in during the storm that we will prioritize based on urgency and they'll be responding to those, as well as the calls that are currently coming in if they're urgent as well. Also, the roads might be flooded, there might be debris in the roads. Our tactical first in teams will be going out right away to clear the roads of any hazards uh, so that our vehicles can get through and respond as quickly as possible. Just keep that in mind when you call after a disaster for assistance, we are coming. You are very important to us. We care about our residents and their safety, but it may just take a while for us to get to you depending on the conditions of the roads. I'm Stacey Losio. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Northport, and today we're going to discuss storm surge and flooding and how both of those affect Northport during a hurricane. So storm surge is when strong sustained winds are constantly blowing over a long period of time over the Gulf and pushing water up onto shore. So when that happens, there is a lot of flooding a lot in beach erosion along the beaches and the homes inland. However, the storm surge can also push water up the river. So it could push storm surge up the Mayaka River, for instance, from the Gulf and then the water coming downstream from the river has nowhere to go. So that can cause water to back up along the rivers and cause flooding. That along with a lot of rain that comes from these hurricanes. Hey, it is 10.58 and we're back to business. Next is uh, continuing on um, 
Code Chapter 5 regarding sign regulations and discussion. City Manager, this is your item. You Thank you, Madam Mayor. We still have uh, Assistant Director of Development Services, Lori Barnes, here to take us through Chapter 5. All right. About signs section. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich still here? Oh, Commissioner Emmerich, are you there? We, we are back. I'm here. Okay, good. Yeah, yes, yeah. okay, just want to make sure you, you are listening. Thank you. <laughs> good morning again. Lori Barnes, Assistant Director of Development Services. I'm presenting Chapter 5 of the proposed Unified Land Development Code, which will contain our sign regulations. Um, as stated in the legislative text for this item, our, our outside legal counsel has already reviewed this chapter and they have materially participated in this chapter because of the importance of sign regulations as to the Free Speech Clause of the First Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. We do have two consensus items um, that will be presented as part of this presentation. Otherwise, we would caution in any uh, significant changes to the proposed draft as it stands because of the legal implications and knowing that additional legal review would be required if anything significant were to be changed. Um, in 2015 in Gilbert, Arizona, uh, there was a community church that filed suit against the city as to temporary signs in the public right-of-way and an assertion that their free speech was being impeded upon and that they were not provided equal protection under the law. So in 2015, the U.S. Supreme Court did rule in favor of the community church and found that the city sign regulations being content-based were impermissible under the Constitution. So you can imagine, as this Supreme Court ruling came down in 2015, when Elena Ray and I came to the city of Northport and found that the sign code had not yet been updated to be compliant with that Supreme Court ruling, we were um, very surprised and a little bit horrified, actually. Um, and so we are very pleased to be bringing something forward that is uh, constitutionally compliant and provides for signage, we believe, that will be more consistent with the building size and massing that we're seeing in many of the uh, DMP applications <coughs> where developers are requesting modifications to our sign regulations so that they can size signs that are consistent with the building massing on their property. <clears throat> Chapter 5 is broken up into four articles, administration and enforcement, sign types, sign standards, and sign variances. What's new? Um, there's a lot that's new, much of it tied to the Supreme Court ruling in the Reed versus Gilbert case. Um, in the administration section, we do provide for substitution of non-commercial speech for commercial speech. We provide that the regulations are content neutral. We are exempting government signs from the sign regulations at the recommendation of our legal counsel. If we incorporated government signs, we would be entering into the land of minutia as far as regulating things like traffic signs, street signs, um, et cetera, which are already addressed in FDOT's uh, Green Book. Uh, the definition section is included in signs rather than in the definition appendix proposed for the entire ULDC. This again was at the rec recommendation of our outside legal counsel. Having a self-contained sign code makes it more easily defensible in light of a challenge. We have incorporated rules of measurement, which explain exactly how we measure sign sizes, areas, and heights. 
And we've incorporated a new approval process where signage will be approved through a certificate of zoning compliance rather than through the building permit process. Uh, this does two things. First, it allows for a review of signs that might not be required to have a building permit um, and also ensures that we are meeting the timelines that are incorporated in the draft that have been upheld as constitutional in other court cases. We are incorporating provisions that require property owners to maintain their signs in good condition and requiring that signs be removed when they are no longer in active use. This is an example of the measurement of standards section where you can see um, images that clearly depict the manner in which those signs are measured. And we've incorporated the exceptions to the building permit section that we've discussed with the uh, city certified building official, <clears throat> wherein the Florida Building Code clearly wouldn't require permits for these types of signs. Uh, Article 2, what's new? We have a matrix of allowable signs by zoning district. This uh, provides for signs on developed sites as an accessory structure and signs on vacant sites as a permissible primary use. And we've also identified prohibited signs here. This is uh, the table for the permitted signs. And this is an example where all of our sign types are listed and they're listed as either an accessory, permissible primary, or prohibited. In Article 3, we are incorporating limited duration signs. These limited duration signs provide opportunity for speech outside of a temporary sign. Temporary signs allowed, are allowed for 30 days. What about real estate signs? Does every home sell in 30 days? No. What about signs on active construction sites that advertise mm -hmm. the developer, the builder, the engineer? They last longer than 30 days. Um, my child is graduating from Northport High School. <coughs> Do we want to limit that signage to 30 days where someone is wanting to celebrate their child's success? Do we want to... Um, prevent people from having opportunities for speech during election periods, or any other time for that matter. A personal expression sign um, <coughs> in their yard, if they want to convey a message of something that they believe in, um, whether it's something to, we love Northport, um, I love my church, anything like that would fall under the personal expression signs. Um, as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, we are uh, basing allowable signage based on linear front footage of the property for freestanding signs and of the building for wall signs. This provides for regulations that um, <clears throat> will give allowable square footage in excess of what's allowed under our current code and therefore provide that signage that's more consistent with the building size and massing for development. Um, we have segre segregated the standards for individual signs versus multi-tenant signs, so it's not confusing, and it's clear that if you have a multiple-tenant site, the regulations that govern your signage are going to be different than a single-user building or property. And lastly, and most importantly, when it comes to the Supreme Court ruling, these regulations are not based on content. In other words, our code enforcement can go to a property, they can count the number of signs on the property and the sizes of the signs, they can come back to the office, they can determine what types of conditions currently exist on that property or in the community and, and make a decision as to whether they are exceeding their allowable signage or not. There is no condition in our code under which that code enforcement officer will have to read what the sign says to determine if it's allowable. 
This is the definition of that limited duration sign. The, after 180 days, however, that sign will be considered a permanent sign. And it will either need to be removed or it will need to be permitted as a permanent sign if it is allowable in that district. And that ties back to the Florida Building Code's allowances for temporary uses for 180 days. This is an example of the sign allowance based on the linear front footage for a single use building. And uh, freestanding signs for individual businesses or entities. and then our multi-tenant sign standards. Uh, last article, Article 4, is regarding variances. We have incorporated in the draft the ability for the ULDC administrator to approve minor variances in certain circumstances. Major variances would be considered by our zoning hearing officer, which is what we're proposing moving to in the new ULDC because of our difficulty keeping Zoning Board of Appeals members and a quorum. Um, so that does conclude my presentation. As far as the regulations, I'd like to talk about our consensus items. There are two. The first is regarding non-conforming signs and the question as to whether the city commission wants to incorporate a sunset date in order to require these signs to be removed by a certain date. Some cities incorporate a sunset date, some don't. Some find that the natural progression of sign deterioration and the substantial damage clauses requiring a sign to be brought up to code or removed if it's damaged more than 50%, they find those are enough. Others want to set dates to have certain types of signs removed. For example, pole signs. Uh, many communities want to see those pole signs removed within five or 10 years and not wait out that substantial damage for removal of the signs. So. I can tell you that the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board did make a recommendation on Thursday that some type of sunset date be incorporated for the non-conforming signs in the city. Um, the caveat here is that any sunset provision will not apply to billboards, and we'll get to that in the next consensus item. Now, Madam Mayor, would you like me to go to the next, or would you like to consider this one and then the next one separately? Uh, maybe we should stick to one at a time. All right. Is that are you okay with that? Right there? Yeah, sure. Okay. So you first want to take the non-performing signs? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. What are our thoughts on that, Vice Mayor? Yeah. Um, I think a reasonable sunset date, you know, should be imposed. Uh, you know, was there uh, a specific recommendation that they made? The Planning and Zoning Advisory Board did not make a recommendation as to types of signs or timeline. Um, there was some conversation about providing a year. Um, in my professional opinion, a year is not enough. If you are going to sunset signs, mm -hmm. you need to keep economic development in, in mind, provide a balance, provide staff enough time to notify mm -hmm. all of these property owners and business owners that their sign would be subject to a sunset date so that they can plan for their own businesses how to and when to uh, replace their nonconforming signage. Do you have any kind of a feel for how big an issue that is? Are there tons of them? We have a substantial number along US Highway 41. I could not tell you how many. <clears throat> I would staff, I mean, would staff feel that that a sunset date was important or, or 
what are the downsides of just allowing nature to take its course, so to speak, even if it takes years to come? I mean, there's enough eyesores along 41 separate and apart from signage that it's not like it would be the biggest issue in the world. And I, 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 it, it bothers me that we would put the onus on businesses who, you know, it, it, let's face it, you know, for some economic times are great, for others they aren't. And I would hate to impose this kind of obligation, whether it be a year, two years, three years on businesses, you know, that, you know, here's just another cost, I'm moving elsewhere. I don't need this, as opposed to let the sign fall apart and then it has to come up the code and go from there. I mean, it, staff have any kind of a leaning here? I. I will state that this is a policy decision, sir. I can. <laughs> I can. I, 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 I can. I can offer some. Some. I can offer some commentary on what we've incorporated in the code. So we have incorporated mm -hmm. in the code maintenance requirements, whereas we do not have those <coughs> currently. So the maintenance requirements would um, would help to ensure that those signs are that the poles aren't rusted, that they're clean, neat, painted properly, that they're not in serious disrepair. Um, the other uh, provision that we have is the removal provision if the signs are not being actively used for a period of time. Um, so we, we have built some safeguards in. Um, it just comes down to the question that how important is it to the commission that all signs comply with the new regulations sooner rather than later. Um, the city that I once lived in, um, they had non-conforming signs that went back as far as 1952. Um, sometimes they were in good repair, sometimes they were not. <clears throat> Um, and there were some in the city who would have liked to seen a hurricane come and blow it down and cause more than 50% of substantial damage. So, um, you know, it is a difficult question, but it is a policy question. And that's why I wanted to make sure we mentioned the economic development factor, as well as the other safeguards that we've written into the code for maintenance. Well, then I'd be against setting a sunset date, I think, like, I'm okay with leaving them the way they are. Let nature take its course. You know, we got something in the code to keep them clean and keep them maintained as best we can. And, you know, I'm good with that. I don't think we need to impose a sunset date on businesses. We got enough problems to deal with. Okay, Commissioner Langdon. Mm, yeah, a um, couple of questions. Um, I sort of see a distinction between a permanent sign and a temporary sign. I'm a, well, um, I would certainly be okay. Let's do this. Give me some examples of temporary signs. And temporary is 180 days no. or less. Okay. So first of all, the sunset date for non-conforming signs would not apply to temporary signs or limited duration signs. Temporary signs are for 30 days, only under certain circumstances, a special sale, a grand opening, that kind of situation. The limited duration signs, again, run the gamut from uh, election season signs to uh, construction site signs to real estate signs to personal expression signs to uh, new subdivision sale signs, those type of things. And those are limited to the 180 days. So the non-conforming sunset date would apply to your business signage. Um, again, some limit it to pole signs. Uh, some live it, limit it to uh, pole signs and roof signs. Although I'm not aware of any roof signs in the city of Northport, other cities have them and, and are not comfortable with the aesthetics of them or the safety concerns surrounding those. Um, so that being said, you can tailor it to certain types of signs only or any permanent non-conforming sign that has not otherwise been approved by a variance or a modification to the code through a development master plan 
or within a VDPP? Yeah, I, I'm comfortable requiring sign maintenance and sort of being specific around expectations. We have a number of small, older businesses, particularly along 41, um, who have invested in permanent sort of attached signs. I would be very uncomfortable requiring them at any point to have to replace those signs with a conforming sign as long as that sign is in good repair and isn't getting shabby. Um, how, how would you recommend we deal with hurricane damage signage? That's already incorporated in our current code and in the draft code, and it falls back to the Florida Building Code um, and, and the same provisions that FEMA uses. Mm -hmm. If your sign is damaged more than 50% of the value of the sign, it needs to be brought into conformance with the code, either by modifying the sign, if it can be modified, or by removing and replacing. Okay. Um, another question, I might be drifting a little bit more into the detailed document rather than just the, the two questions, but um, personal expression signs. So am I to understand the examples you used were sort of positive signs, but what if there's a sign drifting into hate speech? Who determines that? Is there any provision for protecting against that that doesn't conflict with the Supreme Court ruling? We cannot regulate content. So anyone, and this has come up in other communities, and other communities have dug in their heels, and they've been sued, and they have lost. Mm -hmm. um, expletive, name your politician, mm -hmm. we cannot regulate. Wow. Okay, I'll save my other questions to the deeper dive into yes, the document, but, but I'm inclined no sunset so long as the business is maintaining their signs and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, um, one of my questions I submitted was what was the purpose of this um, removal? To me, it's an undue burden on a business, a nonprofit, um, anybody that erects a sign to have to have it removed by an X date. So I am definitely not in favor of that. With all that said, how does B in the non-conforming signs section of the code that deals with properties that were annexed, if a property is annexed into the city, they have until whatever, if we're going to sunset this, if it is the policy of not removing the signs, would an annexed property have to comply with our code, proposed code for signs, and they would have to remove whatever is not, um, because we didn't issue the permit, we didn't, we didn't do any of that. But this policy in B is saying that they would have to have the sign removed. Okay. Um, the the non-conforming sign clauses, uh, frankly, whether five, Point one point nine point B was written explicitly in the sign code or not, anything on their property that is non-conforming to city regulations falls under a non-conformancy clause, and the 50% damage or destruction applies. Once they come into the city, they're subject to city regulations across the board. Doesn't matter whether it's a sign regulation or whether it's a building size limitation, if they are damaged or destroyed up to 50% of the market value, they're subject to bringing it into compliance with the current codes for the jurisdiction in which the property is located. That being said, this applies whether we explicitly describe it in the regulations or not. Um, our outside counsel is recommending that we do specifically address annexed parcels. Um, if you were to 
um, adopt a sunset date that would apply to all properties in the city limits now and those annexed in the future as well. So if you look at B and hearing the, the seems to be the consensus or guideline of my fellow commissioners as to no sunset date would be B, which is the annexation part of the clause. Would that be removed entirely or would that still be a non-conforming, but yes, they can keep their sign regardless if it depending on when they came into the city. Correct. So if they have a non if they if they have a non-conforming sign, they they're currently in Sarasota County. Correct. Right. I'm thinking Warm Mineral Springs Motel. That's what popped into my mind when I read Warm Mineral Springs Motel is a non-conforming sign. Okay. Okay. Once it comes into our city limits now under the current regulations, it's a non-conforming sign. Now, mm. they'll be subject to the substantial damage clause. That's just what it is. It's any other business in the city is subject to the substantial damage clause. Now, they also have the option to request a variance because once a variance is granted for a sign that's non-conforming, it becomes conforming. Um, so in as much as Warm Mineral Springs Motel has a unique sign, a historic sign, they might be able to meet the substantial hardship criteria under the variance section. And that might be an option that they want to pursue um, so that they may not be subject to that substantial damage clause. But the substantial damage clause exists whether you all decide to sunset nonconforming signs or not. I'm definitely not in favor of having a sign removed, whether you're annexed in, whether you're an existing property until it's met its end of useful life. In the, the owner of that property and that business just determines, hey, we need to change our sign. Yes, so ma'am. That's where I'm at on it. Okay, Commissioner Emmerich, <clears throat> you want to weigh in? Uh, I'm coming. Yeah. yeah. We just discussing the sunset, or are we still are we st discussing signs as well? We're so, on sunset, sunset, yes, sunset for non-conforming signs. Just the sunset, I'm a no. I'll make that one sweet. Okay. But I do have I do have questions about the other stuff, so let me know when. Okay. I had a question about the um, non-conforming signs. They do not have to follow our current maintenance codes. Is that what you said? For the they will have to follow the maintenance codes. That's non-conforming signs. Correct. So maintenance like the International Property Maintenance Code that you recently adopted. Oh, right, right. Yes, maintenance we can we can require <clears throat> okay. once those regulations are adopted. We cannot require them to modify their sign to meet our current regulations oh. unless it's damaged more than 50% of the market value of the sign. Right, okay. okay. Thanks for clarifying that because that, my concern was starts to fall apart and we can't do anything about it and it just becomes this round the circle thing of trying to get that done and um, yes and and you uh, vice mayor mentioned about our businesses but they're they don't have to be signs that advertise local businesses correct we don't have any whatever whoever wants to put something on that sign those billboard signs we have in 41 what we're talking about here? We do not have any billboard signs okay. permitted through the state on 41 in the city limits. Oh, so these are just for businesses that we have? These are just for our businesses. Okay, okay. And what is, what is, what is an example of a sign like that? Wendy's. <laughs> Wendy's is a good example that just popped into my mind. Um, but there are several businesses that have the, the pole signs um, they're taller than 15 feet. Right. They do not. They don't have the enclosed base. The proposed regulations also require to have a landscaped area around the base of the sign to incorporate the street address of the property uh, to help our residents, to help our um, our EMS and uh, public safety workers. Not that they don't have GPS, but having that 
street number on a monument sign can be very helpful to everyone. Okay, so thanks for bringing that up about our new maintenance codes. We'll address those signs that need to be cleaned up, workings, and I don't know if that applies to lighted signs, you know, when some of the letters go out. It applies to all oh, signs. It does. Okay, <laughs> so that would address that as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Commissioner Langdon, did you have something else about non-conforming signs? No, I'm good. My the rest of my questions are right. about the document okay. itself. Not so. Do we want to have a, con a formal consensus on? I'll make that. a consensus. Go ahead. Uh, ask for a consensus to not require a date for removal of non-conforming signs. <laughs> Okay, we have a consensus by uh, Commissioner McDowell to not have a uh, date for non, a sunset date for non-conforming signs. Not require okay. removal of non-conforming signs. Oh, okay. All right, Commissioner Langdon? I'm a yes. I'm a yes. I'm a yes. Commissioner Emmerich? I'm a yes. All right. There you go. Got that one. Yes, ma'am. Um, if I could have the presentation. Thank you. The next consensus item is regarding outdoor advertising signs, also known as billboards. Uh, billboards are regulated by the state under Florida Statutes Chapter 479. Under the state regulations, there can be a billboard sign permitted every 1,500 linear feet from any other permitted sign on the same side of the highway. They limit the height to 65 feet and they limit the maximum area to 950 square feet. Um, the outdoor advertising signs are permitted by the state of Florida. Um, the state of Florida does permit local governments to adopt more restrictive regulations, which they will consider and adhere to when they're reviewing permit applications for outdoor advertising billboard signs. Um, in the city limits along I-75, we have 15 existing billboards that are properly permitted by FDOT. Um, under the statutes, and the regulations regarding sign spacing, the city of Northport could have 78 more billboards on I-75. 78. Um, so the, the, the issue with the billboards is, you know, they, they can be a traffic hazard, they can be distracting, but more importantly, and I apologize if these images shock people, more importantly, the city can't regulate content. Um, these signs can be of a sexual nature. Um, they can be distracting to drivers. They can be offensive to families um, with children. <clears throat> these signs can also address religious and social issues, which again, may be offensive to some and not so offensive to others, depending on the content. Uh, they can get very political and um, incorporate things ranging from the war overseas to um, social issues, which some may or may not agree with. And then, of course, the usual um, Presidential politics signs, um, which again, depending on the content of those signs, may or may not be offensive to some and then not others. Uh, staff is recommending the continuation of the 15 existing billboards. The reason being that under the statutes, requiring removal of a billboard is considered a taking, and you as a city would need to compensate the billboard owner for removal of the sign. And that is not just for the cost of the sign structure, that is the cost of their loss of income over whatever established year period can be supported by case law. Um, there was a time when FDOT um, 
made, a, made an effort to remove some of these, but the, the costs were just so high in compensating the owners of these signs that they just couldn't continue that program. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board on Thursday also recommended that the commission proceed with the retention of the 15 billboards and to prohibit any additional outdoor advertising signage on I-75. All right, let's hear about that now. Uh, Commissioner Langdon. Um, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. So the advertiser does not own the sign. The sign is owned by a company who leases that space. Generally. So we can have no expectation of certain kinds of content or not. We cannot. Okay. Um, Thank you. The individual owner of a billboard may have standards that they impose on their leasee but we can't get involved in that. We, we cannot tell someone what the content of the sign may be within our city limits. Okay. That's it, I'm good. Okay, Mr. McDowell. Yeah, um, earlier you had mentioned that there are no signs in Northport city limits on US 41. There's one that's, that's really close, if not in the city limits, it's right like on the cusp. So. With that said, what if that property gets annexed into the city? Are there provisions in this code for those potential annexations for that sign? Because this is, you're saying, is only on 75. I'm forward thinking, what is the ramifications for 41? Well, the ramifications for 41 is they would no longer be permissible signs in the city limits anywhere besides 75 where we're allowing the continuation of the 15 billboards. Um, but what about the one sign that's on? The one sign that's on an annexed property that comes into the city that's would fall under about. the non-conforming clause. Okay. Um, because it wasn't it because it wasn't incorporated in the 15 billboards provision and it came into the city limits after adoption of these regulations and would therefore be considered non-conforming. So it can remain on up until it meets that 50% threshold. Correct. I would definitely, if we'll get a consensus, but I'm definitely not in favor of having, yay, 78 more billboards. <laughs> okay, Vice Mayor. <laughs> yeah, I I also feel well. Well, you know I'm a, I'm a First Amendment rights guy. The thought of tons of outrageous billboard signs along 75 in Northport doesn't turn me on, unless it's a Bucky's, in which case I'm okay with 75 Bucky's or a South of the Border set of signs because I like those. Oh but other than that, no, in all <laughs> seriousness, I am. I'm good with 15. I think that's more than sufficient. All right, Commissioner Emmerich. I'm coming. All right. Now, uh, whose property are these billboards on? Is that DOT property? Yes, sir. And who, who receives the uh, money for the rentals of these uh, billboards? The owners of the billboards who have been granted permits to place the billboards on 75 through the state. Okay, and then how can we as a city dictate to DOT what they can and cannot do on their property? We are permitted to either prohibit any additional signs on 75 within the city limits, or adopt more stringent regulations than the state currently imposes in the statutes. We are authorized right. to do so. We are authorized under the state constitution, under the Florida statutes to regulate signage as a municipal incorporation. But you cannot regulate the uh, content that they're putting out there though, correct? We cannot regulate the content. We can regulate location, 
height, size, number, we cannot regulate content. Right. That's what I'm trying to get at. I just, it's kind of hard with, with it when it's DOT's property. I know it's our city, but then again, that, that's just a tough one. I'll, I'd be a no on not putting out anymore, but I just wanted to get that out there so everybody knows what we're dealing with going forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, going off that, that last um, discussion, that all the billboards are on FDOT property? Is that what you said? Yes. Because the southwest quadrant of um, 75 and Sumter, I remember when the people who owned that property had to went through the city processing planning to, in order to put that billboard up there. So did, is that as part of the process, they make the made the application and then FDA, FDOT took it over? You know what I'm talking about, that billboard that's right there? Right. I need to look closer into that. Um, the billboards that we presented on the slide have FDOT permits. And it was my understanding they were all on FDOT right of way. Um, I'd need to look closer right. to determine if that is indeed on private property. Regardless, though, if it's on private property or FDOT right of way, it, it still would fall under the restrictions um, disallowing any additional. Um, okay. Also, depending on when that billboard sign came to the city for approval, I'm not sure when that was, what regulations may have been in place at that time. Um, currently, though, FDOT controls who receives an outdoor advertising permit for billboards. Okay. Um, because I, I have some personal connection with that billboard because that parcel, uh, that was like in 97, 98, they had cleared trees from that site more than they were supposed to, and the city actually had to go to court <coughs> for that. Um, so I remember that. That was a private owner who had that, that property. But regardless, it doesn't matter you're saying whether it's FDOT or privately owned, these regulations would apply right. for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I would be in favor of keeping the, the 15 that we have and not having any anything else go up there. Yes, ma'am. We, we assumed that would be the case, and that's why the draft is written the way it, 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 it is. Um, however, it is a policy question, and we wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to weigh in and make the determination that that was the direction you want for the city right. to go. Okay. And I'm, I'm also reminded of, yes, I'm dating myself. Back in the 1960s, Lady Bird Johnson had this whole big campaign <laughs> to beautify our highways because they were being cluttered with all these signs. And I don't know how they got that, but they were able to remove signs that people had put out there. But that's what I envisioned, 75 more signs along. It would just be just horrendous um, to be looking at that. So um, I'm glad to see this brought forward. So looking for uh, a consensus, but Deb, yes, go ahead, uh, Commissioner. I have Dallas, a follow-up question, yep. which kind of piggybacks off of your points about that one sign on Sumter and 75. With all of the residential properties that are along 75, they're they're on their private property in the city limits outside of FDOT's right away. If let's say I owned one of those properties, could I put up a sign that <clears throat> is political in nature or uh, anything like that? Um, you could put up a 12 square foot personal expression sign on your own property. Mm -hmm. but what it, so I would not be able to put up a billboard of sorts no. that the passerbys could see. No, our current... Okay. I just want to make yes. sure that that's covered yes. in it because we do have yes. a ton of property yes. that affronts. Yes. yes, so they would be limited to the signage allowable under our regulations based on the linear front footage of their property. They'd be limited to the monument type sign 15 feet high, and whatever square footage allocation they would be allowed under Just want to make sure, our you. regulations, unless elsewhere preempted by the state. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have any public comment on this? Okay, so I'm looking for a consensus. 
I'll make a consensus Go ahead. to not allow additional billboards um, except for the 15 existing billboards on 75. All right, so that's the consensus, Vice Mayor. Oh, I'm a yes. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a yes. I'm a yes. I'm a yes. And Commissioner Emmerich? I'm, I'm a yes on that, but I have a question. Okay. What if one, what if one of those billboards changes its content and it turns into something else? SOL. They change, they can change their content all the time. All the, time. The, the structures will remain mm -hmm. under the regulations. The content will continue to change over time as it always has. Okay, I just wanted that out there because the content can change. Okay, but are so, you, a, you a yes for that? I'm a yes. Okay. Yep, I'm a yes. All right, so you have your consensus for both of those, correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. Now, do we have any questions about the, yes, okay. I, I had a just a question about uh, our backup. Is there something missing? Am I, is there a page I could have? You know, when you have the um, the sign types here, it ends at P's. Isn't there another? No, that's that's the that that's is the only in the presentation, ma'am. We oh. wanted to give you an example of what the sign type tables looked like. They're fully incorporated for standard zoning districts, activity center zoning districts, and village zoning districts and the text of the sign regulation documents. Oh, that's why I saw it then. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so we'll move on to general questions about this chap sign chapter. Vice Mayor? I would like to talk about the subject of temporary signs in the right of way. <laughs> um, I think that's on all of ours. <laughs> yep. Um, I mean, the city can put up signs to promote any sort of park and recreational activity anywhere it wants, because actually, you know, the land is the city's land. One could make an argument that the citizens own the city. And so we have a lot of nonprofits. We have a lot of organizations that promote activities throughout our city, events that benefit our citizens. And it seems to me that we could find a way in this, you know, sign ordinance, uh, 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 an ability for permits or whatever you want to call them for folks who are running activities, who are going to do special events that our citizens will benefit from. Not everybody uses social media, hard as that is to believe. And as many people have said, as they drive up and down 41, as they drive along our main arterial roads, they see signs that say, oh yeah, this is coming up on Saturday. They see it all the time with city events. But I think from the Chambers to the Kiwanis to a whole host of nonprofits and other groups, I don't see any reason why we can't find a way to accommodate, even if we pick selected way, you know, uh, rights of ways around our city, off the on the ulterior on the arterial roads, I don't see any reason why it may be a little messy. It may be a little bit of pain in the neck. It may be oh, people don't take them down in a timely fashion, and we have to pull them ourselves. But it just seems to me we ought to accommodate this. It's for the best interests of our community and our and our citizens. And hell, if the city can do it, why can't the people do it? Why can't the others do it? So I, you know, I, I get the the you know. The discussion on both sides of this, but but I, I just I just think we really really should find a way to accommodate. Okay, so I I will I will try to address the substantial issues with temporary signs in the public right of way. Uh, the the largest issue is the equal protection issue equal protection under the law. We cannot selectively approve signs in the right of way. We cannot, 
we cannot adopt a regulation that allows a nonprofit organization or the Boys and Girls Club or the YMCA or whomever sports league might be offering these activities. We cannot selectively allow them to place signs on the public right of way and not allow everyone else. Everyone your else. fence company, your contractor, your we buy houses, your um, your removal. your tree removal, your I expletive commissioner so and so. We cannot selectively authorize signage in the public right of way based on whom is placing the signage and based on what that signage says. We cannot. It comes down to an all or nothing. The city can authorize anyone to place any sign in any public right of way, or we can allow none. Now, you could identify specific corridors where temporary signage in the right of way is permissible, but you'll have to provide equal protection. You cannot say, well, if this is a nonprofit sign, it can be 12 square feet. And if it's a commercial advertising sign, it can only be three square feet. We have to provide equal protection under the law. We have to treat each organization, business, resident the same. Well, and yes. with that, you can end with a proliferation of signs that distracts your motorists, impedes your pedestrians, creates maintenance issues for our public work staff. And so it does come down to that policy question. How okay. much does the commission so, want to allow? So if we try to think outside the box and a nonprofit wants to run an event and it comes to the city, because after all, the city likes to partner with its nonprofits and says, would the city advertise this event? So we have an ordinance that says, there are no signs in the right of way. But what if the city chose to advertise an event for somebody? Could you do that legally? That is a question for our city attorney's office and our outside counsel. You're likely still going to run the risk of equal protection clause issues because of the fact that you're selectively determining who the government is going to place signage on the behalf of. City, and so, you know, we, we can run that by council for sure. Isn't it not sure. selective when the city turns around and says it's running a city event on City Green and it puts up signs in the right city of way? City Green is not a right of way. City Green okay, is wherever, private property. Wherever the right of way is. It's All I'm property. saying is if the it's city determines city -owned it, property. if it's the city yes. wants to advertise it, regardless of whether it's an event that the city is running mm -hmm. or whether anyone else is running, then doesn't that sort of exempt it from this equal protection? I mean, you can't tell me that we can't figure out a way to skin this cat. Otherwise, I say, let anybody put signs everywhere we because can, this is just yeah. not right. Yeah. So when, Elena, <laughs> I, yeah. so when the, when the KKK comes to the city and says, I want you to sponsor this event with me, and put my signs in the right of way, and we say no because of who they are and what the signs say, then are we facing a, a challenge? Um, that's the risk you run. Last I checked, there's still a constitution and a bill of rights. And you know what? As much as I find it despicable, if that were to be the case, then so be it. Think of the hundreds of businesses and and, and citizens groups and nonprofits that want the ability to advertise. And there's no doubt that it is impactful. The Chamber, Kiwanis, any one of a host of organizations are going to be seriously impacted by the inability to put signage in the right of way. What about what, what about elected officials? Are they not going to be able to do this too? I just don't see that this is the right direction to go. I just don't see it. And, and I think that, you know, if some group wants to run something that 
you know, is, I mean, I, I agree with you that we shouldn't allow signs everywhere because 8 million, you know, lawn signs and I sell houses, I buy houses for cash looks terrible. But you can skin this cat by coming before the city. And you know what? If a group we don't like asks to do an event, you know, where do you draw that line? There is a constitution. There is a bill of rights. People don't have to go to it. They don't have to go to it. If they want to put a sign in a right of way, and you can designate those areas in the right of way. It doesn't have to be every right of way. But we are just so impacting those groups that support our city, work for our city, and the hypocrisy of saying the city can do it, but they can't. I just don't buy. I just don't buy it. Anyway, that's all I got to say. All right, Commissioner Stokes, yeah. ma'am, thank you. Yeah. Um, if there is consensus amongst the commission to potentially proceed in that manner, we can certainly put the question out to our legal counsel. Um, However, it, you know, it may or may not be a provision that is incorporated into the sign regulations. It may be something else entirely. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that the, the other way to skin the cat may be a slippery slope. And it's not something that I think Elena and I want to um, speak to or make recommendations on without hearing from our legal counsel. Mayor. Uh, okay. Mayor. Wait, Commissioner McDowell's been waiting. Is that okay? Oh, okay? I'll go after her. That's fine. I just got a same thing for this same topic. So when she's done, please. Okay, sure. And I'm I'm going to be short. Um, I hope. So the commission back in February of 2023 said, okay, we're not going to allow temporary signs in the right of way. The city of Northport is not allowed to put their um, event signs in the right of way. Um, and for a little while there, they kind of forgot that, but then were reminded and have no longer been putting in city event signs in the right of way, which really is no benefit to anybody. I mean, the Hurricane Expo would have been a really great event to really have advertising in the right of way. But yes, we made the rule. If the nonprofits can't, neither can the city. And for that reason, um, because a lot of people do use those signs, as one of our public commenters, our young public commenter, said earlier, that you see the sign, you kind of go, oh, that sounds like fun. We got, we got an hour to kill. Let's go to the expo. All right. We used to allow those kind of advertisings by permit. So let's say the, I'm gonna pick on the chamber, no offense chamber if you're listening. The chamber is hosting an event. They're hosting the event and they have to get a special event um, permit to host that event because it's open to the public, all right? There was a provision <coughs> in that permit, uh, that application, are you going to have signs? And the commission approved all of this paperwork. They say, yes, we're gonna have signs. They were issued a little sticker that said special event SPX24-010, showed what that permit number is associated with. And they were allowed to put signs out because they were having a special event. The city of Northport does special event. They have to go through the same application process they can say, yes, we're going to have signs, and they can put signs out. In my opinion, when we had our February 28th commission meeting last year, in the legislative text, it said that the city attorney has been asked to provide a legal opinion as to whether the action to discontinue issuing permits for signs in the right-of-way was an appropriate action and what options were available to the commission. So I asked the city attorney, could you please provide your legal opinion? Could you please provide what some of those other actions we could take? She was not, she responded, I did not draft a legal opinion. I think right then and there is the first thing we need to do. We need to get an illegal opinion to see if the city can issue a permit for signs when there is a special event that is open to the public. That would kill the roofing signs because it's not a special event. So I really think that that's something we really need to look at. 
um, and, and see about getting that legal opinion. Um, and if we can't regulate content and directional signs, well, I'm sorry, my yard sale sign in the right of way is a directional sign. It has an arrow pointing to my house for my yard sale. They have directional signs that allow the city to show where the fire station is. And by no means am I saying my, my yard sale is more important okay. than a fire station location. But at the same time, it's content. And, and I get that there are certain signs in the right of way that the government has to have, stop signs, fire station signs, that kind of stuff. But at the same time, my yard sale sign up for three hours on a Saturday is not harming a soul. But, um, so I'm just putting that out there. Um, and hopefully we can see about getting a consensus to have the city attorney draft that legal opinion about permits for special events. All right, let's hear from Commissioner Emrich. That's exactly where I was going. Was they used to be able to do that, and there yep. was a section in the special permit to go out exactly. there for location stuff like that. My main point is, is if we want to consider ourselves a community of unity, and we have organizations out there that want to put on some type of show or whatever for their community, it's awful hard for them to advertise it. They pay their money for their special permit. There is no other means of advertisement, but hey, in, in this document, they propose that, yeah, there are alternatives of uh, advertising. And I do believe it's, uh, yep, you can put it on AM radio, you can use a phone book or cable television. That's just going to up the cost if it's on cable television. And I'd like to see anybody that has a friggin' phone book yet. Um, so to be able to do it by, you know, special permit is fine. If not, I say open up the gates and let them all go out there because we are not allowing our citizens to be able to do what they need to do in their own community. When we passed this ordinance last year, we seen the problem. We did see government signs out there instead of nonprofits advertising their wares until they were reminded. And again, in this new ordinance, it says the government's exempt. So there we go again. Every mm -hmm. The government can do it, but nobody else can. Th right. this, this is bad, and it's not good for the citizens. That's all. All right, Commissioner Langdon. I have all kinds of other questions, but I'll stick with this <laughs> since uh, mm -hmm. I think um, some decision might come out of it. Um, either everybody does it or no one does it, including the city in terms of the right of way. Um, I do like the idea of in the context of a special event, there would be a sign section that would have to get approved. So I agree with Commissioner McDowell, I'd like to get a legal opinion on that because I think that would solve a lot of problems. I, I, I could not support allowing anyone to do a sign on any right of way. It was junky, but also from a marketing perspective, just it doesn't help. It doesn't do any good because you sort of see this mass of content. You don't see anybody's individual message. So um, I, I would nix allowing everyone everywhere, but if we're not allowing anyone anywhere, then that should include the city. But I am interested in that special permit approach. Solve a lot of problems. Okay, so um, two things. First, um, if the city commission wants to um, prohibit city <clears throat> departments from posting signs in the right of way. I would recommend that we do that as a policy decision, not by incorporating any regulation of government speech in our sign regulations. Our outside council specifically recommended exempting government speech from our sign regulations. So the commission could adopt a policy that um, restricts placement of government signage in the right of way. And you know, as to the signage approval with a special exception permit, you're back to equal protection. You're allowing for a certain organization under certain circumstances to be provided with an opportunity <coughs> for speech on public property, but you're not allowing anyone else to do so. 
Um, you know, we're happy to get that legal opinion, but it does come back to that equal protection. Is everyone being treated the same? Um, additionally, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized in their rulings the difference between government speech, government signs, and private speech and private signs when it comes to public right-of-ways. The U.S. Supreme Court recognized the need for government entities to be able to place signs on the government-owned property. And while we say it's owned by the citizens, it's legally owned by the citizens. it is owned by the entity of the government. And there is a U.S. Supreme Court recognized difference between advertising, for instance, a hurricane expo that targets the entire community and benefits the entire community because every single business and every single property owner and every single renter in this city needs to understand the importance of hurricane preparedness. And a private entity that's targeting only certain people for a certain event who might be interested in a certain activity. So if you do not put an exemption on government signs in the right of way, then that takes out street signs, stop signs, traffic signals, all directional signs for the government. You can't say just a street sign or just, you know, a certain type of government sign. In the ordinance, it needs to say government signs are exempt. And then, then we would recommend if the commission wants to ensure that event signs are not put in the right of way, then do that through a policy. Otherwise, we will run into the problem of all government signs. And that's your stop signs, that's your yield signs, your street signs, or any other sign that is... is necessary to be in the right of way for what road closed construction was okay um i i just want to put it out there i don't subscribe to the, the thinking that what's good for the goose is good for the gander as you said it's city-owned property but um not necessarily public property meaning people can just do whatever they want with with our right aways because we don't permit that. We don't permit people to erect a tent, uh, you know, uh, on the right of way and say, well, it's my property, I can do that. Um, and that we have to be able to have a system in place to organize how those right of ways are maintained and how they're controlled. And again, if it's something that is for the betterment of our system here, Putting out a sign that it should be allowed, and it shouldn't even be a question. I'm sorry about comparing that to putting on a, an event. And um, I am one who's sitting up here who can attest to uh, putting on special events. I've been involved with one for 27 years, and uh, the whole permit for signs, how that has evolved in the city. At one time, we did have to go before the commission and actually, you know. Please, sir, can we, can we put out these signs for this event? And then if Public Works didn't get the memo that they approved it, they would pull the sign. So that's when we finally got into the permitting with the special event permit that you had to uh, put a list where exactly you're putting the signs. We were given a number so Public Works would know this has been approved. This is not just somebody who randomly stuck a sign in the right of way. But that came with all kinds of stipulations that had to be so many feet from the road and, and the whole bit. Um, I also want to bring up that the city of Venice has a pretty good system in place for their um, signs for events. They have to be connected with a special event, but they have certain locations. I like that idea that they can they can go in and they, you have to say which locations you're going to use and they can only be put up seven days before the event with an arrow. And that's how you know when you're driving through there, oh, this is coming up, that's coming up because they, they have those, those signs in certain areas. So I would uh, like maybe to see that pursued because that's more organized and in certain areas that people would know this is where we can look to see what's going on 
in the city. Um, I know, for example, over in Inglewood at Dearborn and Pine Street, I think it is, there's a bank that pretty much is the corner for all things going on in Inglewood or Dearborn and 776 that you know they're going to be putting up signs there when there's things going on and you kind of know that. So we can maybe look into that. I don't know what ramifications that would have if there were certain places that we designated for special event signs to connect it with a um, application for a special event. Um, and uh, I, I do agree that our, our nonprofits and that are putting out events out there, um, you need to have the ability to let people know what's going on. Um, and it also, it does, I like seeing those signs because it tells me that people are involved in their community and it gives me some hope that there are people who want to do something nice for, for Northport and by having certain events, whether they're big events or small events. So we have the ability to put that little sign out there. Um, to me, it's very human and it, it brings that human spirit to our community. Um, Vice Mayor. Yes, well, certainly the sensitivity to the, to the legal issue of equal protection or equal rights under the law. I get all that. And that's why I go back to, to me, the cleanest way is to say, okay, we don't allow, you know, signage in, in the public right away, except the government, of course, is exempted because the government can always exempt themselves so <coughs> with that too. But that's where I say, let any party come before the city make application to have the city advertise that event. If the event is open to the public, if it's all inclusive to the public, just like everybody needs to know about hurricane preparedness, well, you know what? Everybody needs to know about people for trees. Everybody needs to know about a lot of different things that are put on in this city let the city do it as a partner with their nonprofits. It's the city's advertisement. It's not the nonprofits. And if some I buy houses for cash guy wants to sue the city over that, maybe like they should go ahead and spend their money on a lawsuit. But it seems to me that to always err on the side of, oh God, somebody might sue us here when we are going to directly and significantly impact businesses and, and event planners and think this is just wrong. There are picks, pick on the two that are most prevalent, Chamber and Kiwanis. Those people do so much for our city. They are so helpful to our citizens and to restrict their ability to advertise in a right of way. There's a way to do this, to skin the cat, to get around the law. People find ways to get around the law all the time and to mitigate the, the potential <laughs> that they'll be sued. And you know what? It just seems to me we ought to do this. It's just wrong. Otherwise, nobody should advertise or everybody should. And I don't care how horrible it looks. Let everybody put their signs there, okay? Because otherwise you are hurting the very groups who support our city, help our city, go out of their way for our city and our citizens. And I just cannot support that at all. All right, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, to to wrap this up, um, I, I really- Oh, I wanna go again. Okay. Um, I really <laughs> would like to make sure that if we do do a um, city attorney uh, legal opinion, that it's not just nonprofits, that it's, you know, let's say the art, well, the art center is a nonprofit. Let's say there's a school play going on, you know, <laughs> they should be allowed to advertise. Uh, the Sound of Music is playing in the Northport High School. Um, if I, as a person, want to put on a, a hurricane expo and I've paid for the Morgan Center or the Mullen Center to use City Hall, City Center Green, and I want to advertise it as myself, I should be able to be able to do that because it's helping the, the community. Um, really, we need to look at baseball signups. My goodness, if, if the kids aren't playing baseball or soccer or whatever other activities that are happening in our city and they don't know that signups are coming up, well, now they miss signups. 
Who's to say they might get into trouble now and now we've got police problems. You know, we've got to be able to allow this kind of advertising in our city because not everybody goes on social media, not everybody goes on our website. We, passing through is how people find out about things. And, and I really, really think that there has to be a way, to your point, Vice Mayor, to skin this cat, to make sure everybody is going to be able to be happy, including the city events, because city events is totally different <laughs> than a stop sign in the right of way. That's all. Okay. And thank you for bringing up the, the sign-ups, because all those signs are technically not permitted. Yeah. Exactly. And, and they're but, not associated but, with a right. special event. Right. Well, one could make the case. <laughs> well, you could. But, yeah. All right, Commissioner Langdon. I'll let Pete go first. Oh, okay. Commissioner Emmerich? Yep, I'm here. Yep. Hey, uh, Commissioner McDowell got so close to where I was going. Ooh, the missed... nonprofits or whoever, whoever out there, they pay for that special events permit. They should be allowed to advertise. Mm -hmm. If yes. it's in a special block saying this, that, and the other, it's not going to get, you know, Joe business owner or Phil's fantasy folly signs out there when they're not paying for it. Oh, yes. You know, it's in that permit, you know, so therefore Joe's fencing, if his signs are up, they come down. But if the, let's say the uh, Kiwanis puts up a, a sign for the Hurricane Expo, which they did help put on, um, it goes up a week ahead of time. You come down a week after the event. You've got it legislative. You've got regulations. You just you just got to set up a new program on how this is done. And then over the months, people will get in order. And then, you know, sooner or later, people are going to get, you know, tired of buying their signs and getting them thrown away. And they'll say, why is the clock? Oh, there's an event this weekend. That's what's going to happen. But you can't take away from the nonprofits to be able to advertise their special event when they're paying for it, when they're paying for part of the uh, Mullen Center or wherever they're at. They're paying for that. They should be able to advertise it and recoup their funds so they can help the community. I can't say that any any better. Okay, thank you. That's it. My high hours. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Langdon. Yeah, just a, I'm very supportive of what others have discussed, but just a couple of things I'd want to bring up. I'm an, <clears throat> an audiologist and I'm going to have an educational session at uh, a restaurant about different options for hearing aids. Does that qualify? It would have to qualify because we can't restrict just nonprofit. Correct. So I just want to correct. put that uh, out. Yes, correct. However, however, because of the um, confusion with the special event permit process versus the temporary use process, um, we have proposed in the new ULDC that special event permits apply to events held on city-owned property and within the city-owned right-of-way, right. whereas temporary use permits apply to privately owned mm -hmm. property. Um, that way it's clear through which agency mm -hmm. you are receiving your permit authorization, whether it be Parks and Rec or Development Services. Right. That um, was going to be so, my next so point. That type of approach would trigger a change in the regulations as drafted for special events and temporary uses, number one. Number two, um, when you talk about the special event authorizing or they paid for the Morgan Center and that should authorize the signage. Well, well, what about the place of worship that paid for their property, paid to build their building and has an event every weekend that could benefit the public if they were to attend those services? yet you deny their signage because they're not renting a city facility. Equal protection under the law. This is where that Supreme Court ruling really ties local government's hands in as much as they want to provide those opportunities for certain events open to the public, but it runs the gambit. 
in Gilbert, Arizona, it was a church that filed suit against the city. And keeping in mind that the Florida statutes in land use challenges now provide for the prevailing party to be paid their legal fees. Um, so this is a, an issue that I, I can see the commissioners are passionate about. And if there were a way that is consistent with the statutes, the case law, and the best planning practices, we would be bringing that to you. Um, so again, you know, we will proceed with consensus from commission to get back with our legal counsel and bring something back. Um, however, we recommend, as written, prohibiting <laughs> signs in the right of way. Right, uh, and I'll let me add to it. As Barnes just said, the the Gilbert, the Reed versus Gilbert lawsuit. The church was holding weekly services. Mm -hmm. And they wanted their sign placed in the right of way to advertise their weekly special event. There were other special events that were taking place that the city allowed and permitted to be put in the right of way. The city would not issue the church a permit because they said, well, your event takes place every week. Your services take place every week. It's not it's special. It's not a special event. <laughs> The church sued, and the church won. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court very clearly, and if you've read their arguments and their, their opinions on this case, they were very clear that if you're going to allow an entity to place your, a sign in the public right-of-way, it doesn't matter who it is, and it doesn't matter what it says. All you can regulate is time, <coughs> duration, size, and place. Those are the four corners that we can regulate, and that's it. Now, some cities have said, we're going to create free speech zones. And so this particular intersection, from this day to this day every week, Friday to Monday morning, is going to be a free speech zone. Anybody can put a sign up, as long as it's this size, and this far away from the pavement. Now, you may have 100 signs there on a weekend, but they let them do it. Doesn't matter what those signs say, doesn't matter who puts them up. It could say, we love our commission, or something else. It could say, we're having an event over here. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, but it's, you know, certain intersections where they will allow that. Uh, it can get messy. Uh, their code enforcement departments on a routine basis will have to go by there every week and take out hundreds of signs. But in order to allow the nonprofits and the other organizations that they want to be able to have a place to advertise their events, they open up that location certain days a week for anybody, as long as they comply with the size and they keep them off the street a certain way and they don't block the sidewalks. Ms. Ray, uh, you mentioned four things that... Time, yep. I'm sorry, location, yep. size, duration, yep. and place. Height, sorry. Height. Isn't that size? It really kind of is size, but location, it's size, location, size, time, the duration, dura the duration, height. So can I ask when I, I mentioned up what the city of Venice does, just piggybacking. Up city of Venice said. hasn't been sued yet. Right. Okay. Because they're, they're specifically tied to special event permits, yes. not in general. The only thing I want else. to say is that the city of Venice has not okay. been sued yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You May, read my mind. May I speak? It's my turn? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, so the way <coughs> I see this, since, since I am a realist and I know that despite whatever legal opinions we get, it's going to come back to equal protection 
and basically it's going to blow up it, the vast majority of our entire conversation here about somehow allowing certain types and other things we can't. To me, the only two solutions are either set up a handful, a group of free advertising zones that are perpetual, seven days a week. These are areas in our city that we allow anybody to advertise in. Or conversely, let everybody advertise in a right of ways. They're the only two realistic options here, legally, that we're going to be allowed to do, just so everybody gets it. That's what we're going to have to decide, because I will fight for the right of anybody to advertise for their events. Excluding them, not allowing them, is just not acceptable to me. And I don't think it's acceptable to the citizens of our city who have a say in this. I wish the room was filled with people who are speaking out on this. And I know there's plenty listening. So my take is that perhaps the least invasive and, and objectionable might be to set up a series around, because you can't just pick one location, because depending on where events might be held and other things might go on, you need to sort of pick strategic locations, 10 or 15 around a city, however many is reasonable, and to say these are areas in the right of way where anybody can advertise, in conformance with what the law says, and, and leave it at that. I, I will say um, it's an easier way to control things. We used to get a lot of phone calls about signs. We would get calls from residents that the signs were blocking visibility of traffic. They were blocking visibility of pedestrians. Our police used to call our department a lot because they had signs that they felt like were in dangerous places. Um, we had public works had a real problem trying to mow right-of-ways because of the proliferation of signs. Um, we got calls from neighbors who lived close to intersections that said, I'm embarrassed to have people over because there's there's." 50 signs at the corner, and it looks terrible. We did get those calls. Um, we don't get those calls anymore. <laughs> um, but but the, the issue of allowing them anywhere, you get that proliferation. Most cities don't allow them. The county doesn't allow them. You still have some every now and then, just like we do. But it's, it's more controlled chaos rather than... Free for all. And harken back to the billboard conversation and the disturbing images. If someone places a sign in the right of way in the free speech zone or all over the city um, regarding Palestine, Israel, uh, KKK, abortion, uh, you name it, um, disparaging one of the commissioners. Code enforcement can't go and pluck that sign and leave everybody else's there. Thank goodness. So, so you know, just you know, keeping keeping that in the forefront of of your minds about if we allow those, our code enforcement cannot be pulling them. Okay. Mayor. Yes. I'd like to ask a question on this. Okay. Will you yeah, I, uh, I would just say that sorry. before you go, Pete, let me just finish off. Yeah, yeah go I, ahead. You're fine. You know, of the two, obviously, the, the air, you know, having areas mm -hmm. of advertising, like having these advertising zones is to me the least inoffensive. It, it, it makes more sense. And as to the fact that anybody could do it, yeah, I got to tell you, I just like anybody find, you know, certain types of advertising offensive. Who's to say what's offensive and what's not? This is America, man. We have freedom of speech. We have a constitution. And I don't want to see some neo-Nazi sign up there on a sign in, in an advertising zone. But if it's there, so be it. I don't have to look at it. But you know what? If they don't have the right to do it, then I don't have the right to put up a sign that says, love your neighbor. And you know what? I can live with it. And I think we all should live with it. I mean. Government just can't legislate and control everything that we do. 
and I don't mean to make a speech, but I got to tell you, we got to have a way for these people to advertise in certain areas and right of ways. And if this is if this is the best we can do, then maybe this is the best we can do and have a series of spots where they can advertise in. That would work for me and probably would satisfy the vast majority of those folks out there who, who are concerned over this issue. All right, Commissioner uh, Emmerich. Yeah, I'll be brief. I got two things. Uh, Phil has a great idea out there on that. The only thing is, is we've got to make sure that they are specific areas that are centrally located. We can't have them all the way out in BM Egypt when we're doing something over at uh, Dallas White Park. You know, they have to be centrally located. They have to be good for the uh, the people that are putting it on. So that's going to be a little bit of work in itself. But this is for staff. How much are we paying for code enforcement to pick up signs out there? That's right. So there's there's... I can't put a dollar amount to it, but I can tell you well, that how, many, how, right how now, many people go out? How how many sweeps do you do a week? How many how 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 many man hours is used picking up signs out there that could be possibly used for something else? So if we're not worrying about signs, they could be doing something else like, oh, this tree may fall over on somebody's house, or hey, they got 18 cars in their driveway, which is more important to certain citizens than these signs are out in the middle of the, the right of way. Typically it's not that much time. Um, if they have an intersection where there's been a proliferation, we had one business that put up, I, they counted over 40 signs. One business put 40 signs along both sides of, of the street. And so that took a little bit more time. But we typically don't spend, I mean, if, if I have a code enforcement at, officer spend more than an hour a week doing that, that's probably a lot. Um, okay, it's good. then. The, uh, it's not that much time. We had a, we, we had more back before we, the word got out that we weren't allowing them, um, then it would take quite a bit of time. Um, we had, we had an officer working on Saturdays at one point, um, back some time ago. Um, but it's, it's the, the issue has diminished considerably. So now we really don't have that much of a problem and don't spend much time on it at all. But why, why were these other signs being picked up back then? Were they not allowed? Because if they're allowed, they don't need to be picked up. There were signs that were, the, a lot of times the signs, the police would say they were blocking visibility on, on intersections. They were blocking the sidewalk, um, those types of things. So that's one of the reasons why signs used to be picked up. Okay, that makes sense. That's all I had, Mayor. Okay, Commissioner McDowell. Yeah, I'd like to see about trying to get um, uh, the consensus um, I think when we had our last discussion in February of 23, there was a proliferation of signs because of unscrupulous um, people taking advantage of our citizens after the hurricane. Um, I had a question though before your consensus. Can I can I ask, uh, Director? <laughs> the, um, this is for signs in the right of way. Does this apply to private property? No, no. And private property is also considered not just our own private property, but um, shopping centers, that's, that is private property, correct? Yes, yeah, so if, an, if, if someone's holding an event and they want to go to a property owner, a friend of theirs lives on Price Boulevard yeah. and says, hey, I'm having this event, would you be willing to let me post my signs in your yard? Well, under the personal expression sign, temporary sign section, mm -hmm. You can have 12 square feet of signage. So with permission from a property owner, your nonprofits can post signs on somebody else's private property because it doesn't matter what those signs say. So it's back to the same thing that was discussed back in February of 2023. We're not saying these organizations can't advertise their events. 
for saying they can't put those signs in the city right of way. So it might require some additional legwork on their part to build the relationships with the people who own the property in the vicinity where they want to post the signs. But it wouldn't involve the, the clutter of the public right of way. They'd be set off far enough from the right of way so they wouldn't be an issue um, impeding traffic. Um, and there would be no need for code enforcement or public works or anyone else to go pick up those signs to be able to do maintenance in the right of way or whatever. So there's still the opportunity for speech. And the way this sign ordinance has been written is to provide the largest opportunity for speech and to do so in many cases without requiring permission to do so, not from the government. Not from the government. Right. So, you know, we we um, you know, we're 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 willing to proceed in whatever manner your consensus directs us to, um, and go back to council if necessary. Right. But we we haven't we haven't reduced people's ability to speak. And it pretty much follows. It pretty much follows. Um, Political signs, what the rules are for political signs. So, so you cannot put up a political sign in any right of ways, but they can go on private property. Correct. Which is why we see them in shopping centers. And if that's owned by a particular person who backs a candidate, that's why you're going to see a big sign in that, in that right. shopping center. And keep in mind, the, this ordinance was drafted by legal experts who are experts in signage, who have watched and followed and in some cases participated in these these lawsuits and these rulings. The Supreme Court and, and other court cases have continued to tighten down on what we can we can do. And the way this is this ordinance is written isn't because anybody wants to <coughs> restrict speech. It's written to protect the city and in turn the taxpayers from those legal battles that are being fought all over the country on this issue. And we certainly don't want to restrict anyone's speech, um, but the legal cases mm -hmm. have really done a lot to restrict what we can do and what we can't do. And, you know, nobody wants to have to adopt regulations like these. Um, it was, seemed a lot, it was a lot easier for everybody. A lot less administration, a lot less pain when we didn't have to go through all of this. Um, but the, the courts have really mm -hmm. taken away a lot of our latitude on it. Right. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And I, I agree when people had more, I guess, self-control and we're able to regulate themselves and just know what really is good for the community and not good yeah, for the, the community. Yeah. We wouldn't have it. Um, yeah, and it's, it's ironic because the more people just do what they want, and I used to tell this to my, my uh, son all the time, you know, you can have that party, show me what you can do, and as soon as he didn't do what I wanted him to do, that's it, no more parties. And so, yeah, because you, you ruined it for yourself. So that's what I keep thinking of uh, this. When we're talking about this, so I'm done with that. Commissioner McDowell, did you wanna? I still see lights on, Mayor. Yeah, I'm hoping to get a consensus so yeah, we can before, move on. Before but... you do, if you can be <laughs> just a little more patient, Commissioner McDowell. Um, you know, we are restricting people's freedoms. Okay, we're doing it because the government says you have to give equal consideration. Everybody has to be treated equally. You can't legislate content. I get all that. But we're respiting by saying it's just easier for the city to just deny anyone to advertise in the right of way because it's just that's simple, not. easier, and cleaner. Well, that doesn't cut mustard. I know the letter of the law says that the city owns the right of ways, but the spirit of the law says the citizens are the city. And I'm not splitting hairs. It just seems to me that, okay, if you don't want signs all over every right of way, 
pick 15 strategic locations around our city where anybody can advertise in these free advertising zones. Let them put their signage in there. Who cares what the content is? It's irrelevant. Let them advertise whatever it is they want to advertise as long as those four criteria are met as far as the signage requirements and be done with this and allow everybody to advertise what they need to advertise. It just seems the right thing to do, to restrict it. You can dress it up any way you want. It's still restricting people's ability. And to say you can do it only on private property, sure. That makes it that much more difficult for those people. They got to go knock on doors. Excuse me, can I, can you, I put a sign on. You know, there's just nothing wrong with advertising in selective areas of, of, the, of the right of ways. We can get around this law by doing it that way. We're keeping equal protection under the law. Everybody gets to. It just seems the most logical way. But the city would much prefer to say, no, we don't want to have the signs here. We don't have to worry about them. Nobody has to look at them. It's like, do it on your private property, and you've got all the freedom of speech you want, but don't do it on the public right away. And I just, that's just, just, it, it, it's an affront to those organizations that support our city and that need the ability to advertise in certain areas of the right of way. And I don't see why there's such a resistance to this. I just don't. It, it, it sends a horrible message to these groups. I'm sorry. All because of the staff and, and city wants to be expeditious. It just is just wrong. Anyway. Okay. Commissioner McDowell, are you ready? Yeah. And yeah. Just, just for everybody's edification so that when we continue this conversation, the table for temporary signs, it says that they are not permitted in residential areas based on the table that's in here. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, okay, so let's see if we can get a consensus. Um, to have a city attorney um, perform a legal opinion to allow issuing permits for signs in the right of way when the applicant has a special event permit applied for using public property. All right, that's our first Consensus, Vice Mayor, I'm going to start with you. Uh, yeah. I'll say yes, even though Commissioner McDowell, with all due respect, I, I'll say yes because I'll support that, but, but I know what they're going to come back with already, and I don't have to be a lawyer to say it. They're going to come back and tell us it's a problem, but let's go ahead and do it because we asked for it a while ago, it was asked, and it was never done, so let's... They said that they were doing it, and we never and, got and it. And it never did, so let's... I'm uh, city attorney. Yes. Uh, if I could just jump in for a yeah. A moment. Yeah. Um, if, if the commission wants the city attorney's office to, to review that issue, we can totally do that. However, uh, staff has a relationship with Vice Rudder, who are the subject matter experts in this area, um, could probably get that um, more effectively and more efficiently if, if it is the will of the board to, to have them go back to that council to get that. The, the chair of, of their uh, department speaks nationally on this issue. They would be the subject matter experts that we would turn to for, for an answer like that. Um, if, if I don't think it matters issue. who provides okay. it, but provide Anyone. a legal yeah. opinion. Right. If, whether it's the okay. city attorney, I would assume that the city attorney talks to other attorneys and would get this done. I don't care who does it, but just to have this, uh, I'm tasking you, the city attorney's office, to provide this legal opinion. Okay. Uh, I get it. I'm a yes. I mean, yes, but I don't just want a legal opinion, do it, don't do it. I want the best option for facilitating this type of expression or communication that, that sort of minimizes our risk. Mm -hmm. That was my next part. Or maybe not minimizes, contains it. Okay, Commissioner Emmerich, did you hear the, what we're talking about? Yes. Um, I'm a yes on it. As the city attorney came, they're going to go to their mm -hmm. their people again and give us a national type thing, you know, decision. I'm not worried about black and white national stuff. I'm worried about doing the right thing for our community. Period. How do we do it, and how do how do we allow our people to participate? So I'll be a yes if they want to go around and do that rat race. But when it comes back saying, oh, no, it's still legally binding. No, we, 
I'm not into that. I'm I'm into letting our people use those arenas to be able to advertise. Period. Thank you. All right. So we do have a consensus. Thank you. And, and the second part was to uh, Commissioner Langdon's point of we need other options. Just because nationally this is what the experts say we can and cannot do, okay. we need to have some options available for things that we might be able to do in our city, whether that be allowing it in a designated area um, for events only, see, and, and that you're paying for those signs. Um, and I, okay, we may not be able to do that, but we need to figure out another way to allow our nonprofits and our, our city government to advertise signs. There has to be a way. We cannot be the only city that is having this problem because of the stupid Gilbert Reed issue that came down from the Supreme Court. So I'd like to get a consensus to have a city attorney and staff work together to come up with other viable options to allow this, these kind of event signage to be placed somewhere, someplace mm -hmm. within the city. Okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Langdon, I'll go the other way. Um, not sure we can limit it to events, but I get the spirit of the uh, intention, and so I'm a yes. Okay. I'm a yes, and I can't remember if we define special events in our special event Yes, we do. That's what I thought. So that would take maybe take care of the weekly things. That's really not a special event then, I think, according to that definition. But and anyway. the special event is for so, city-used property. No, I wouldn't restrict it. Well, um, our special event permit, I, we there's two different caveats. We're going to have to have them yes, come up with the right. ideas. Let's... Right, because there are special events I, on private property. If I could, if you if you don't, if your direction doesn't limit it to special event okay. or special event, because I really think you're you're getting down that same Content road path. as to why the church sued and yeah. won. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I, if you would just let us work on those options, the the one that that I brought up about freedom of speech zones, where they've it. established, I mean that's a that's a reasonable thing that is, you know, but. But there are cases where P City of Punta Gorda has already been sued and lost. So we want to be sure that anything that we propose hasn't already gone through the courts okay. and lost. Okay. <laughs> if it's gone through the courts, we want to make sure that it's won um, so that we don't lead you down a road that, that we already know has ended in legal disaster. Okay. All right. So designated areas, you'll look into that. Uh, and the vice mayor? Yeah, if, if, as long as the focus will be on your freedom of speech zones, that's the way to do this. I'm an absolute yes look into those areas because that's the way to get this accomplished. All right, Commissioner Emmerich, are you good with that? Yeah, I'm I'm a yes. The only thing is, is I got to add this is because I'm, I, I, I understand the freedom of speech zones. But I don't want to have, you know, like they were saying, there could be hundreds of signs out there. There could well, be this, that, and the other. Well, if if they're the last ones in line to, because they got their, their signs a week before their event, how are they going to fight to be able to be seen out there? Exactly. So these areas have got to be large enough to incorporate the need of whatever type of signage is going on out there. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. But I'm a yes. Okay, so there you go. We have our consensus for those designated areas. We'll come back with some options. Did we need anything else? Did you need anything else? I, I have questions on yes. the rest of the yes. sign code, but I think Commissioner this. Langdon does too. Uh, yep. We'd like to take a 10 minute. You want to take a 10 minute before we get we to the. Yeah, I, I want to plow through, I don't want to do lunch. No. 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes? Right. Okay. Do we have any public comment that we might need to hear so that they... Oh, on, on that particular item. Yeah. Oh. You know, I didn't realize that the talk at each section, so I didn't know that. So did you want to... Come? I would love to. I yeah. I don't even have to get up unless you need me to. Yeah. Other folks have to hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, name's Josh Smith. I'm here all the time. You know where I live. Um, I really appreciate staff being as passionate as they are 
as a business owner who did not know you weren't allowed to put signs out in this city. Um, uh, signs are cheap. I can put them up. If y'all take them down in a month, I sell two injector jobs. I paid rent. So the sign issue really doesn't matter to me. Um, <laughs> this is, I know, I'm throwing myself under the bus here. Um, but as a business, you guys are trying to eliminate the roofing signs and the, you need to understand that I can buy 500 of those for 100 bucks if, online. They show up, I go out my way home, I put them out on the road. There's places, trucks parked around here, I put them out. I think I still have one that they mowed around. I'll go take it down and I'll let them know it's a problem. Um, but I think you guys are trying to eliminate us from doing it. And from an economic standpoint, you can't fight that battle with me. I mean, uh, you can't. Mm -hmm. I, I understand the Kiwanis Club. I have more money than they do. It's sad to say. You know, there, there are things that you're going to limit by making this rule. You, you're never going to defeat me, as sad as that is to say. It's terrible. Is the businessman in the room, I'll say it out loud. I can just outspend you when it comes to this dumb rule. I won't because it's for the good of the city. It, they shouldn't be out there. Um, but I don't think making a, the little areas probably makes sense if that's what you have to do legally. I really understand the legal side of it, but in terms of trying to eliminate it completely, you yeah. can't. I mean, you just can't. That's my opinion on it. I'm sorry. And I'll take my sign down if it's still out there. I didn't know it wasn't allowed. Thank you. I already took it down. <laughs> Okay, so you, that's it, right, City Clerk? Okay, so we want to take a 10 minute break? Ten. You got it. Back at one? Perfect. Okay. We're flooding into the rivers and into our water management systems, causing flooding as well. Public Works does a lot of work before the storm to make sure that our water levels are as low as possible so we can handle additional storm surge and flooding in our water systems. If you want additional information about that, we have a great video about our water control structures and you can visit the Public Works website. everyone, my name is Devon Poulos. I'm the aquatics manager within our Parks and Recreation Department. We're here today at the Northport Aquatic Center just to talk to everyone about our Float for Life program. We recognize that nationally, unintentional drowning is the leading cause of death for children that are under the age of four. So we have an awesome program here called Float for Life. Float for Life is a program that we teach that starts with the fundamentals of floating before we actually learn swimming. This program is targeted for those children that ages six months to four, and what we want them to do is we want them to get comfortable in the water, and if they accidentally fall in the water or find themselves in a trouble situation, they can roll over their back and float. When we launched this program, uh, we were the only one in the state that was actually teaching this milestone program. So we want to give a shout out to our Northport Rotary as well, who sponsored this program here at the Aquatic Center and actually paid for a trainer to come in all the way from Nebraska where this program originates there. We practice and we go through what's called milestones here. So as soon as the kids progress through the milestones, we can continue moving on through them. And at the end of it, it's a pretty awesome program when they graduate. It's one of the final things that they do is they jump in fully clothed and they have to turn over, roll over on their back, and actually be able to scream for help at that point in time. It's just an awesome segment program that leads right into our Learn to Swim program. So that way we can make sure we're keeping our kids safe in, on, and around the water. Frank Lamas, Always Manager. I am here today with Mario Venditti. Mario, tell people here how long you've been doing this job. I've been here five years. Five years, excellent, excellent. Yep. So, Mario, tell people what it entails, what you do. I'm a planner scheduler for the solid waste of the city. And um, I go around and I, I greet the new residents and I educate them on the recycle. Excellent, sounds interesting, very good. Yep. So, Mario, what do you find inside the recycling bins that shouldn't be there? So let's try to tell the people how to recycle right. Well, the most common thing I find, Frank, is plastic bags. Okay. So the plastic bags are not recyclable. I find them just tossed in the container, or they bag the recycle with them. Right, and, and they shouldn't. this is inside the blue lid container. That's right, right inside the blue lid containers. 
Correct. And they should be either taken back to the grocery store or tossed in the trash. Very good. Do you see a lot of recycling inside the containers? Uh, I do. Uh, bags? Yes. Oh, I come across a lot of that. Okay. We don't want to do that. So. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can always look at our website, www.northportflorida.gov slash solid waste. I'm Stacey Losio. I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport and we're going to talk about why it's important to have a go kit and what should go inside of it. It's important to have a go bag because if you wait last minute to pack, there are definitely going to be items that you're going to forget in the scramble to get everything put together. So it's important to have your documents such as IDs, insurance, paperwork, titles for your home and your vehicles and your boats just so that if your home does flood or your roof blows off all those documents are with you and they're safe because you don't want to end up losing those and having to try to replace those later on. Also in your go bag you should think about what medications you might need to have ahead of time if we're under a state of emergency you are able to refill your prescriptions ahead of time even if they're not due yet so it's important to do that. Also in your go bags, you should have non-perishable food, flashlight, batteries, a radio that is battery powered and extra batteries. Should all power go out, we will be able to broadcast on 97.5 FM, anything, uh, any emergency information. So be sure to have your battery powered radio ready and tuned in to 97.5. I'm Stacey Losio, I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport, and I'm gonna tell you the difference between flood zones and evacuation zones, or in Sarasota County, we call them evacuation levels. So flood zones were generated by FEMA, and they're used to determine the likelihood that you will flood, and they're used to determine if you need flood insurance, if you have a mortgage on your home. Now the evacuation zones are based on storm surge data that comes from the National Hurricane Center, and they use topography as well as hurricane vulnerability for storm surge for the area. And we use those to determine who needs to evacuate during a storm. So it's important to understand that there is a difference. If you're interested in finding out what evacuation zone you are in, which we highly recommend you do, uh, you can use your search engine of choice and type in Sarasota County Know Your Level, and that'll take you to the Sarasota County government website. Water in a swale, that's kind of the ditch by your house, is not flooding. Within a, After a storm event, water should be in that swale up to 72 hours after the storm. That allows the water to be filtered, to get the stuff that came off our roofs and off the road out of the water so that when it reaches the habitat, it no longer has those contaminants in it. It also provides an opportunity to slow down water so that the water doesn't go so fast that it erodes um, the roadways or any other infrastructure. So when you see water in a swale, if it's only been, you know, up to 72 hours since the last rain, that is not flooding, that is doing its job. Hello, my name is Devon Poulos. I'm the Aquatics Facilities Manager with the City of Northport. And today we're going to be talking with you guys about our free swim evaluation. It's important that we do these swim evaluations so as uh, kids are registering for swim programs, they get placed in the right class. What we're looking at when we're doing the swim evaluation is every swim level has what's called exit skill assessments. So what we do is we have your child get in the water and we'll go through a series of different movements. Can you go under the water? Uh, can you show us your front crawl? Can you show us back crawl? Can you show us elementary backstroke? Different strokes within there and what we're doing is we're trying to see where your child tests to before it becomes a challenge for them at that point. Once we assess that then we'll let you know and you can go ahead and sign your child up for that appropriate level there. It's important that we have these so that way when we're teaching a level one 
We don't have kids that should be potentially in a level two and a level one class because they're not learning the appropriate skills that they need at that point in time. Right now, uh, when we're in full summer operations, uh, we ask that people come between eight and 10 to do the swim evaluations, just as you can hear the water splashing in the background, slides and everything like that. But any day of the week uh, that we're open, you can come in at any point in time and ask for a swim evaluation. We always have a certified swim instructor on site that can uh, have your child take a swim assessment. I'm Stacey Alosio. I am the Emergency Management Coordinator for the City of Northport, and I'm going to be talking about having an evacuation plan. It's important to have an evacuation plan ahead of time, and it's very important to write it down because that way you can have it somewhere present where everybody in your family can see it and keep it fresh in their minds. And you want to also share it with people in your family or your neighbors so that they know what your plans are ahead of time and how to get a hold of you or where to look for you after a disaster. For your evacuation plans, uh, you should have multiple routes to get to the location you're planning to go to just because Traffic-wise, traffic on 75 might be gridlocked. There could be some very good back roads to get to where you're going uh, that could get you there more quickly without being stuck in traffic. When you're making an evacuation plan, we usually tell you four different things. You should stay home if you are not in a zone that's being evacuated and if your home is built to withstand the forecasted storm. If you can't stay home, uh, and you evacuate, your next option should be to go to a friend or family's home that is outside of the evacuation area and is structurally sound to withstand the storm. Third option would be go to a hotel. They're much more comfortable than our evacuation centers. Fourth option would be to go to one of our evacuation centers, Sarasota all right, County. It's one o'clock and we're continuing with our uh, chapter five on sign regulations, I believe. Are we good? Okay. Um, Ms. Barnes, are you going to present something on this too? Uh, Madam Mayor, I have concluded my presentation. Oh. I'm happy to answer whatever questions okay. the commission has at this point. Commissioner Langdon. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I just have a few clarification questions. What's a pylon sign? I couldn't find a definition for that in the definition section. Off premises sign is where it's at. Ms. Barnes? So there are two different kinds of freestanding signs. One is a ground sign or a monument sign. Yeah. Fixed to the ground. The base of the structure is two thirds the width of the sign. A pole or a pylon sign has one or more, more poles, upright posts, but it does not have that base structure that encloses those posts. And that is under the definition of freestanding sign. There are two different types. Okay, great. Um, on the definition, so page 11, the balloon sign, what about balloons with no message? Just balloons. Um, balloon signs, balloon signs that have no message are not, um, which are not addressed. Their balloons are balloons. Um, we, if the commission wishes to have have no balloon signs, in other words, no blow up inflatable attention getting That's devices <laughs> that don't have a message on them, we can modify that definition. No, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just, this is so that I'm clear on what the intention is. I kind of like those weird little guys. They uh, do attract attention. On page 22, under section 5.1.8, prohibited signs. Mm -hmm. I see vehicle signs. 
Yes, ma'am. Vehicle signs are defined in the definition section. And the intent here is to regulate the use of vehicles for commercial or non-commercial messaging as the sole purpose. In other words, someone has a panel van and they park it in a parking lot at a visible intersection and it remains there. It does not move. It is not used in the regu regular course of someone's business. So if you read closely the definition, um, there are factors determining whether a vehicle is used in the usual course or operation of the of business. And is, is the vehicle operable? Is it currently registered? Does it play a role in the business? Is it frequently moved and operated in the course of the business? Um, so if someone has a commercial vehicle that they use for work, that they bring home, that they park in their driveway overnight, that does not constitute a vehicle sign. If a business has a fleet of vehicles that they park in their parking lot in the course of their business, it is not a vehicle sign. If you have a some type of retail store in a plaza, they paste signage all over the vehicle, they park it at the front of the parking lot, and it doesn't move for a month, it's clear that the sole purpose is for advertising. So it's using a vehicle as a permanent as a sign. sign. Correct. Okay. I wanted to clarify that. Okay, could you clarify for me, um, I'm on page 24, and, and I get X is prohibited, that's pretty clear. Um, P is primary. That's allowed. Accessory to a legally improved site. Could you give me some examples for that or clarify that for me? Um, <clears throat> Page 24. Okay. So P is permissible. That means you can have it on a vacant, unimproved property. Yep. And that would be your personal expression sign, your limited duration sign. Accessory to a legally improved site would be the site where... The, the Circle K over here that has is developed. It was approved through a site plan. It has a building and associated signage. Any shopping center, any business entity, any single family home that has an authorized limited duration sign in their yard. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. And if I'm taking too much no, time, you're just, just move me along because I just want to make sure I've got these. Um, I had a question about personal expression signs, but we've talked about that. Um, under general standards, page 30, so signs um, on private property must maintain a minimum five foot setback. Is, is that from the city's right of way, five? It's from feet? their property line. From the property line, okay. So it wouldn't be from the street, it's from their property line. Right. What, what are other communities doing? It just, when I read that, it struck me as just a, is that a little excessive? So is the reason visibility or safety? What's the reasoning behind that setback? Uh, the reasoning is, in general, visibility and distraction of drivers. Okay. Um, and every right-of-way is different. Some right-of-ways are improved up to the property line. Think mm -hmm. of a boulevard with a sidewalk. Right. Um, they are very closely improved right-of-ways right up to the property line. So you wouldn't want someone placing that sign between the sidewalk and the road. Right. You want it to be on their property and you want it to be set back at, at such a distance that it's not going to be a distraction to a pedestrian, a driver, what, what may have you. Of course, the reason for a sign is to catch the eye, is it not? <laughs> yes, it is. But 12 square foot of signage is not easy to miss even with a five foot setback. Right. Okay. Um, on page 39, there's a set of regulations 
specific to Welland Park. So what I'm reading here, is that already reflecting the patent book of Welland Park and we're just codified, codifying it in our ULDC? Or yes. are there changes? No, there are no changes. Um, this section is not just for Welland Park. It's for Welland Park, Toledo Village, and what will be Bobcat Village. Um, and that is so that we have a quick reference for dimensional standards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you can see, Welland Park, Village A, B, and C, the regulations are the same as our ULDC. Right. Um, and the same goes for if my memory is serving me correctly, the same goes for Toledo Village and Bobcat Village. But this just gives us a quick reference for those dimensional standards, number, size, mm -hmm. sign, and we can review that information easily when we receive a permit or we can convey that mm -hmm. information easily when someone asks us rather than going and pulling an individual pattern plan right. and pouring through the whole book Right. to figure out what size sign they're permitted to have. I get it. I might suggest, and again, this is a nit, but I might suggest calling it something and using Wallen Park as an example rather than West Village. <coughs> I, I just, it kind of set me off on the wrong track with the intention. Uh, that's it for now. Thank you. All right, Commissioner McDowell. And I'm going to piggyback off of some of the things that Commissioner Langdon already brought up, and that's first is going to be about vehicle signs. <coughs> I get to the definition of a vehicle sign, which is really cumbersome to read. I'm hopeful that you guys might clean that up a little bit. Because when you look at the definition of a vehicle sign and then you look at each one of the tables, it is prohibited. Although the definition says, unless, unless, um, the table is saying it's prohibited. Um, so that's why I'm suggesting maybe some clarity in that. Um, the other thing that it says, it's um, factors to consider in determining this vehicle is used in the usual course and operation of a business. Mm -hmm. um, you gave the example that, hey, maybe there's a vehicle that's sitting in the parking lot for a month. <coughs> well, that's not in the usual course of business. Who are we to say that it is or isn't when the owner of that business who drives that truck is away on vacation or recuperating from surgery and it's sitting in that parking lot because he's not allowed to bring it home? So, so that to me is kind of a, a sticky wicket. Um, the other thing is, is the vehicle has a current registration in the state of Florida. There's many people that come down here and they're visiting maybe their family and they're taking their company vehicle and it's still visible from the right of way. It's not going to be allowed. Um, so there's a lot of things in that definition that might need to be clarified. But the biggest concern I have is it is in the table as prohibited. Not as like prohibited with an asterisk, but just outright prohibited. So if you're code enforcement, and you see that poor guy that's recovering from surgery for the past four months and his vehicle is sitting there and sitting there and sitting there, he's going to get cited for it because it's not in the course of action, but it should be prohibited automatically because the table says so. Well, we'll clarify the definition so that it does not include the verbiage of unless. It will state under the following conditions, signs affixed to vehicles are not considered vehicle signs. And that should clarify that portion. Happy to change registered in the state of Florida to current registration. And keeping in mind the, you know, the, the business owner who is recovering from surgery and it's been sitting there, our, our code enforcement officers are pretty good about going into the business and talking to the people and saying, gee, I've noticed this vehicle's been parked here, you know, for 45 days and it hasn't moved and you know we do have this regulation and I want to make sure that there's not a reason why this hasn't been moved is it inoperable is is there an issue with the operation of your business or is this intentionally being parked out here for the sole purpose of signage um, I think that you know in many of our regulations we have to give our code enforcement officers some some latitude to have those conversations and to work with the community and monitor the situation before they immediately write a citation. 
Thank you for that. Um, the snipe signs, a very similar situation. Um, snipe signs are prohibited um, throughout your tables. However, the definition does permit them if it's with permission of the property owner. So maybe, and, and I, I'm just throwing it out there as an idea and a suggestion, instead of having just the three, the A, the X, and the P, maybe there should be that little asterisk that says C definition, because there might be some caveats to that outright prohibition. Okay. So a snipe sign is, the definition needs to be carefully uh, read, and perhaps we can re reclassify the latter part of the sentence as Thank another you. type of sign if there's really some issues with clarity there. A snipe sign is a sign tacked, nailed, posted, pasted, glued, or otherwise attached to trees, poles, stakes, fences, public benches, street signs, or other objects, comma, or displayed on any private property owner without the permission of the property owner. Mm -hmm. So a sign displayed on any private property without permission of the property owner is a snipe sign. A sign that is tacked, nailed, pasted, posted, glued on a pole, et cetera, et cetera, is also a snipe sign. So if you eliminate the tack, nailed, pasted, glued, a snipe sign also includes a sign or other object displayed on any private property without permission of the property owner. I understand. I'm just looking for clarity of it because the table is showing that it's prohibited, but the definition has a caveat to it. And that's, that's all I'm bringing up. Because if I want to, you know, permission of the property owner. And I if you have permission of the property owner and they have a utility pole on their property and you paste a sign on that utility pole, it's still a snipe sign. Now, but it's saying it's prohibited in the tables, and that's it what is I'm prohibited. At. So a snipe sign is prohibited. So a snipe sign could be something pasted on a utility pole, or it could be a stick-in yard sign someone put in someone's yard without their permission. So again, I can see if I can work on something to segregate those terms. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, election signs. And I know we've kind of touched upon that throughout the various discussions that we've had today. Um, yes, I can put an election sign in my yard. Yes, a business can allow me to put an election sign on their property as long as it meets the duration definition. We have a serious thing that is coming up in November that addresses City Hall and outside of, let's say, churches and in the right-of-way when, when the candidates want to advertise, vote for me, um, if this code goes through, will they be allowed to put um, candidate signs in city center green area, at the, at the circle area? It's only for one day. And the way I'm reading this is it's no, they wouldn't be allowed to. City Center Green is not public right-of-way. It is not platted public right-of-way. It is city-owned property. Um, there are also regulations, and I defer to the clerk because I am not well, well-versed on them. There are also regulations on how close to a polling place you can post your signs. Right. Right. So if the city commission wanted to adopt a policy to allow certain types of signage in City Center Green, on certain types of occasion, that's not public right of way. Um, so these regulations allow these signs in residential districts, commercial mixed use, and other districts. And that is for any property with permission of the property owner. Okay. So if there is space in city center green that meets the distancing requirements under mm -hmm. the election laws, and the city commission wants to adopt a policy to allow every candidate to put every sign they want out in city center green on election day, then that could be done. It does not need to be addressed in the sign policy. Thank you. Or for the that. sign regulations. Apologies. 
Thank you for that. Um, there was a thing about city's certificate of zoning compliance. Um, it's, I, I don't know what page you guys have it, but it's section um, 5-1-5B number two. Um, it says that the applicant shall include a copy of their business tax receipt um, in order to be able to put up a sign um, on their property. There are many nonprofits that I kind of did a quick research because a business is like a for-profit business, whereas nonprofits don't have a business tax receipt. And if I am a nonprofit and I want to put a sign up, I have to have a business tax receipt in order to get through the process. And I just want to make sure that something will be done to address the nonprofits to get through the process because they don't have a business tax receipt. Right. Um, well, first of all, um, the requirement to submit the business tax receipt was on advice of outside counsel, um, number one. Number two, as I mentioned in my responses to your comments, I um, there them, are... I have not gotten the responses to, your com to the comments I sent out. That's why I'm asking the questions. When did you send the responses, ma'am? Anyways, it doesn't matter. We're here. So thank yes. you. I will read it, yes. and I will go forward um, with those. So I can, I can answer it briefly. I can answer it briefly. Um, a lot of communities require a business tax receipt registration, even for nonprofit organizations. They simply don't charge the fee. And this way, they have a record of where these, where all the organizations are operating from. Some other communities use them to track fire inspections. I did not have time to check with our fire department to see if they utilize them that way. But we'll, we'll come back with the final draft with either elimination of that or clarity on the business tax receipt process as it relates to nonprofits. And I appreciate that. Now I understand why you seem a little irritated with my questions because I haven't seen them. You did not know I didn't see them. So I appreciate yes, that. Thank you. Um, please give me a little bit of latitude here because there might be some items we need to discuss and get consensus on through my, my question. Um, I will skip over the probe. There's one, hold on one second. Um, there's a couple things in the chart. I will wait to, the very last one about major variance. So if it's a minor variance, it's basically giving staff the latitude to increase it a small amount. Um, it seems that if there's a major change, that they want that exceeds the minor variance that staff will have the ability to approve, um, it will go before the hearing officer, the zoning hearing officer. Whenever there's a ULDC change in code, it's called a special exception. The special exceptions are always approved by the commission. We've had multiple times where a special exception or a modification or a, uh, a waiver to the code comes before the commission and we approve that. It is now going to remove the commission and just go directly to the hearing officer. And I really don't think that that's wise. I really think we are the legislators. We are the ones that should be approving any special exceptions slash waivers or variances or, or modifications. So I really would like to kind of get the feel from my fellow commissioners on that because we're the legislators, not the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Zoning Hearing Officer. Um, so, so under the current regulations, a developer can request a modification to regulations in several different chapters of the code. Um, we had incorporated the ability to ask for waivers and the signed chapter, um, our legal counsel did recommend that we stick with variances and the strict criteria there. And as I mentioned before, the sign allowances that we have proposed are designed to provide for adequate signage based on building size and massing. So we don't see these 
waiver requests or modifications of the code coming through a master plan or development master plan type process. Um, we've given plenty of signage opportunities that can be consistent with building size and mass and property size. Um, we've, we've provided for some limited administrative discretion as far as making slight adjustments to size, to distance between signs, et cetera. And we believe that we're not going to see the request to modify the regulations on the level that we have in the past. The zoning hearing officer or the zoning board of appeals under the current structure, they approve all other variances to the code unless they're part of a master planned project that goes through site development review. Um, so the fallback there is comply with the sign regulations. If you need an administrative var variance, apply for one. And if you need more than that, show us that you have special conditions or hardships and let the zoning hearing officer weigh the evidence and make a decision as to whether those criteria for variances are met. Um, so if, you know, if, if there's a consensus question here that needs to be asked, um, you know, we'll bring that back to our legal counsel if the majority of the commission would like to see these departures from the sign code come back to you all instead of the zoning hearing officer and we'll have them weigh in on that and and i hear what you're saying thank you for that but to for me a variance is hey this is the code and you want to deviate from that code and whether you call it a modification whether you call it a special exception whether you call it a a waiver or now a variance they all say the same thing. You're, you're deviating from what the commission has approved as the code. And to have somebody else approve that deviation, that should be, I firmly believe, the commission's purview, not anybody else's purview. So, um, you know, I, I would love to hear what my fellow commissioners think on that subject. Um, and I believe I have all of the other questions answered, I hope, depending on what you responded to. So if... Okay, we good? I'd like to see... I have a... Okay, because I had a... Go ahead. I had just one question about snipe sign. Um, snipe sign is a, a sign that does not have permission from the property owner. That really is... That's part of it. Right. Okay. A snipe sign is any sign that the property owner has not given permission right. for the sign to be there. Yes. A snipe sign can also be a sign pasted, tacked, nailed, posted on a tree, on a utility pole, on a street sign, on a public park bench, anywhere that it is tacked on. I have seen, I have seen snipe signs attached to existing permanent signs. I have seen a sign on a utility bowl by my son's school in a different jurisdiction that said, this is a snipe sign. Yeah. <laughs> I, saw that. I think that was a little sarcasm in mm -hmm. as much as they were not happy that they were seeing all yeah. these snipe signs and nobody was taking them down. Mm -hmm. um, we got a real big kick out of that. Unfortunately, they had it up so high <laughs> I, I couldn't get it down. I had to have public works go <laughs> take it down. But um, so yes, a snipe sign can be one or two uh, or two things. And again, I'm I'm happy to consider perhaps figuring out how to separate that definition by giving it a snipe sign is a one and or a two or just pulling out that second clause in the definition and cause, calling it something else. Okay, because I, I see that you have, it's uh, listed that they're prohibited in residential areas. So I just wanted to understand what that line is. So somebody can or cannot put a sign in their yard on stakes that is for, for any reason that they, they, can't, they can't though? They can. They can. If, if it's their sign. Yes. 
or if they've given permission for, for somebody, somebody else, else to put it there. But and they can't okay. put it on the utility pole okay. that's in their yard. But clearly, they didn't get somebody's permission. For right. That. Is that what you're saying? And then my second part of the question is fences. Because I know we had this just issue years ago with the people that live along Sumter that back up to Sumter and have fences. Um, that even if somebody had, is that a different sec section in our code that even if they have permission from the owner, they can't put a sign on the on the side of their fence facing Sumter? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, the fence sign definitions um, limit the location and placement of fence signs. And along the same lines, I don't know if we changed this even with fences. For example, I know at one time uh, the banners at the school athletic fields could not face out. They had to face in. Is that still on the books or did we change that? Or that, that is correct. So, so you'll see in the tables that the fence signs are listed as accessory to a permissible primary okay. use. Okay? okay. But you have to go back to fence sign definition to see where they're allowed. Um, okay. A fence sign is attached to recreational fences around activity fields, playgrounds, playing fields, where the signs are only visible from inside the park. And if they're visible from outside the park, face the inside oh. of the park. Okay. So that goes for homeowners. They can put a... No, because it is not a recreational fence okay. around an activity field, playground, playing field, okay. football field, baseball diamond. So do we have anything that pertains to... If it's not addressed as allowable or permissible primary, it's not allowed. Oh. Okay. Did you have a... Yeah. Can I piggyback off yeah. that? Yeah. If I put the sign up and my, my fence is along Sumter, to use your example, it's my mm -hmm. fence, and I want to put a sign on my fence that faces Sumter, I sh I'm allowed to. Mm, that is not how the regulations are currently but written. It, if the commission wishes to allow fence signs, you can <laughs> certainly do so. Most communities only allow fence signs on recreational mm -hmm. fields. Again, if the commission wishes to allow anybody in the city mm -hmm. to put up a sign on their fence, as long as it complies with all the other regulations, then we can change the text to allow that. Um, most communities mm -hmm. do not allow fence right. signs outside of recreational playing because fields. Then you would get into regulating what you want, what you don't want, and we get into that same and, and Commissioner McDowell, I went through this years ago when I knew somebody on Sumter, and they let me put our Florida Northport sign, and the city came and, mm -hmm. and gave me. Yeah, I know. And I paid the fine for them, but I didn't realize that was still on the on the but books. We, yeah. But it, by this, it's on private property. Yeah, it's a sign that's attached to a fence. It should be allowed, regardless if it's a people for tree sign, an election sign, a hey, I love the world sign, who's the city to regulate what's on my fence in my property? <laughs> so maybe staff can really look at that a little bit clearer because. Okay. All right, so right now, so right now, fence signs are a completely different uh -huh. category. That's what you're saying. All right, fence signs are yeah. limited to recreational playing fields. Right. And if there's, there's consensus on the commission to allow fence signs anywhere, as long as they comply with the other applicable regulations, we'll rewrite the draft. Did you make a consensus, Commissioner? Well, Mayor brought it up. I'll, I'll be happy to make a consensus to allow private property fences on private property to be allowed. Signs on signs, signs, signs. Yeah, yeah. My concern with that is you're not going to uh, limit what kind of signs. Like yeah. some, it's my property. Right. So if I say wants to advertise whatever they want to advertise, absolutely. As long as it complies with the rest of the, you know, and it's equal and it's yeah. And it's not just my own private property because mine is residential, but if. Poor old Josh has a, a business and he wants to put a little sign on his business, enter here, he should be allowed to. Well, on his 
Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Oh, I liked it. I, I'll, Commissioner I, Amrich, are you there? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Did you hear the conversation? Yeah. About, yes. About signs on, on fences on the outside of, of people's fences. What do you think about that? Well, guess what? My fence, I'm painting whatever I want on it. <laughs> Atta boy. And this way, too, a business can then advertise for people for trees, if that's what they choose to do. I, oh, my God, what a slippery slope. This is crazy. Um, Michelle, <laughs> do you have something now? No, I've got nothing to add on that topic. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, uh, Commissioner McDowell, you have a consensus, right, on the table? I thought we just went through it and got a yes for everybody. Did we get a yes? I, I didn't, didn't vote. No, we didn't. We, didn't. <laughs> we actually, I wanted to know what Commissioner, oh, I thought Commissioner we, Amherst was no, thinking. Sorry, but no. He hasn't, hadn't been in on the conversation. So, Commissioner McDowell, you made the consensus. Commissioner Langdon? Oh, I'll go with a yes. I'll go with the yes to see where it goes. <coughs> see where it goes. Yeah. I am a yes. Mr. Emmerich? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we have a consensus for that. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of it is, we base a lot of things, unfortunately, on the what ifs, but uh, you know, those are the exceptions, and I guess we could address that um, when they come up, and if they come up. Um, so. Um, okay. All right, where are we in this? Still have? Yeah, what do we, we have on that? The only, if we're wrapping this up, I, I yeah. do want to see about getting a consensus to have the commission approve um, the variances, modifications, waivers, whatever the word du jour is, instead of this hearing zoning hearing officer. The zoning hearing officer deals with zoning. It doesn't deal with signs. I'd like to talk about that a little sure. bit more. Yeah. Um, I certainly don't want us to spend time up here if the sign, if the variance they're requesting for their sign is minimal, but I would want some definition of <coughs> minimal, like... What are the outside parameters of that? There's a minor. I might have missed that. The, Is that the last page? It, well, it's Article 4. It's called variances. Minor variances are approved by under these certain criteria that are listed. And it's ah, approved it yeah, by staff, the ULDC administrator. Um, if you go down further, it says major. Yep. That's what I'm asking for city commission to approve or deny, not the zoning hearing officer. So that you're major? okay with the minor, it's the major. I, I will concede with minor. My goal is to make sure that any major <coughs> variance, which is the same as a special exception, waiver, modification, those should be approved by commission. We're the legislators, not this hearing officer. Allow a sign prohibited by these regulations. <coughs> Madam Mayor, if I may. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the way the major variance regulations are written, um, there is a there is a condition included that the zoning hearing officer cannot request a variance to allow a sign prohibited by these regulations. So the zoning hearing officer, in considering a variance, would be considering dimensional standards, height, setback, area, much like they consider the dimensional standards under the zoning variances that they consider and approve or deny. So I just wanted to give that some clarity there. Um, also, uh, based on the conversation um, at the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, I just wanted you to be aware we hadn't identified a limitation on the decrease in the distance between freestanding signs. So the final draft will limit the ULDC administrator to a five foot de decrease between the distance between signs 
to a 10% decrease in the minimum setback. And those two items were not included in your draft. Um, and then there, of course, is the 20 foot, 20% uh, increase in the sign area and the 10% increase in the allowable sign height. So any other ask beyond that in this draft is to go to the zoning hearing officer and it would be for area height, setback, distance between signs, but not for types of signs. And I just wanted to make sure that that was clear to you all. Okay. If I may. may yes, yeah, go ahead. So currently we have our sign code that allows X um, sign area. That whatever that sign area is, that it's dictated by this code. But let's say somebody who owns a business or anything wants to come up and says, hey, city, I can get this sign, but I'd like to increase it 15% higher than what is allowed by code. Then the ULDC administrator, our staff, would grant that if they see it's acceptable. But if it's 25% more than what is allowable by this code, it would go to a zoning hearing officer for them to approve it. And that is what I'm saying is, is not acceptable. This is a policy decision then. I, I firmly believe that it's a policy decision when staff is making it, but I will concede that the minor ones, okay, I, I'll, I'll give it up. But anything above these minor comes to the commission, not a zoning hearing officer. Lori, did I hear correctly, though, even on the majors, <laughs> the hearing officer can't, can't approve an exception or a variance that doesn't comply with the code, right? They can't approve a sign type that is prohibited. So you could not go to the hearing officer and say, I don't want to have my freestanding sign have a, a base that is two thirds the width of the sign itself. I just want a single metal pole and this is, I'm asking for this variance and these are the reasons why. Well, that type of sign is prohibited by code. So the zoning hearing officer says no. If someone is asking for um, the maximum height of the sign is 15 feet. Um, they are going beyond a 20% or 10% increase, okay? So they want a sign that is 20 foot instead of 15. The variance application would go to the zoning hearing officer. Just the same way, if it weren't part of a development master plan, uh, building height variance would go to the zoning hearing officer. Um, a setback variance for beyond the five foot distance between freestanding signs, if they wanted to make it two, foot, two feet between freestanding signs, they would go to the zoning hearing officer. Similarly, if they didn't want to have a 10 foot setback, they wanted to have a five foot setback, zoning hearing officer. Same if somebody was building a building and they wanted to have a smaller setback than required. Um, so it, it does keep these as quasi-judicial proceedings. It does incorporate strict criteria and required findings for approval, whereas the current modification process or waiver process doesn't have that same standard for approval. So the zoning hearing officer will be controlled by requiring the findings be met and if the zoning hearing officer turns that down, then that person's appeal process would come to the city commission. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I was headed. Like, it, it seems like it's not so much an issue of, of seating authority as much to me as it is, the, you know, the zoning officer is in the best position to make this determination and make sure that it's kept nice and tight, make sure that it's within quasi-judicial parameters. And if 
he rules he or she rules against, then whoever made application can always appeal it, which will come to us. It makes a lot more sense than it just coming to us where we can just willy nilly make a decision as a commission. Oh yeah, let's just grant it or not grant it. Because it wouldn't come to us as a quasi judicial, would it? Uh, no, not under an appeal. And right. um, if, if, if you'll bear with me a moment, Commissioner Stokes, I may have misspoken based on my, my um, I just want to verify the appeal process we have drafted. Um, every community is different. And sometimes my messages get mixed a little bit. Um, some communities, and I think we may be one of them that has the appeal for the zoning officer going right to the circuit court. And mm -hmm. I just want to verify that for you because I may have misspoken. Is that Commissioner Emmerich's dog that I hear? No, that's Commissioner Emmerich. Oh, that's Commissioner <laughs> Emmerich. <laughs> yep. He's hungry. <laughs> it's his belly. Thanks for clarifying that. That's my dog. Okay. We thought it was you. I was, I'm just waiting to speak. That's fine. Okay. You want to let him? Speak? Yes. Do you, do you want to chime in, Commissioner Emmerich? Because uh, Ms. Barnes is looking oh, something up. Okay. Uh, oh, we're good. You got it. it. We're good. What? Zoning hearing officer first appeal, appeals to the city commission. So, and then if you were to deny it, they could always okay. appeal to the circuit court. So, yes. Yeah. So, if the zoning officer does not, denies it, hearing officer denies, you all would hear the appeal. Oh, okay. okay. You know, I'm definitely good with leaving it at this level. I, I don't I don't see it an issue of seating authority as much as like what's the most expeditious and most sensible way. Let let the zoning officer handle it and it becomes a problem for, for the applicant. It can always find its way to us. I'm good with that. Yeah, that sounds good too because I, I can see it taking a long time that that applicant would have to wait <coughs> to be on the agenda and do all that plus, plus and if, if it's something that that zoning officer can just say this is good move it plus forward two, the zoning officer has to operate within the confines whatever of the judicial the rules comes to us, it's not so it's a little more structured okay illegal. commissioner emmerich did you want to weigh in yeah um in my opinion i'd rather have five people's decision rather than just one so I'd, I'd rather have those decisions come to the board. And who's to say what's minor and what's major? I think we should be entitled to be listening to these things, you know, especially with sign ordinances. So I'd be a no on that one, I guess. Okay, Commissioner Langdon? Yeah, boy, I'm, I'm really on the fence. When I had first read this, I sort of assumed that if anything was other than a minor variance, it would come to us. Um, and I was comfortable with that. I certainly don't want to see things that are minor. Um, boy, but if there's something beyond that, I would prefer us to see it. And usually that's not the way I roll. <laughs> <coughs> Typically not the way I roll because I do like efficiency on this board and um, people who are experts in certain areas, I feel, are more qualified than myself to make that call. But boy, signs are just a hot, hot issue. Um, and if something is beyond some minimum leeway, then I really do think it ought to come to the commission. Okay, so we don't have a consensus. It's three to two. Um, if I can just offer yeah. a, a little bit more. So, um, Say, say, for example, someone's ask were one square foot more than staff could authorize. It's still pretty minor. Yeah. And to, you know, to require the commission. Um, the, the second thing is this provides for an additional step in the appeals process. If the, if, if the ask comes straight, straight to commission and you deny it, the next course of action for that applicant is the court. Um, so that would provide the two-step appeals process within our jurisdiction. Um, so that being said, I appreciate the conversation, and we'll proceed um, as written. That's okay. right. As written. No, I 
this I thought is that was three to two. It, well, well, because it's yeah. a because right. we are in a right. workshop, so, we cannot yeah. now go to a motion and it would pass that yes, it comes to the commission. Right. But we have three people that are saying yes, it comes to commission. Two people are saying no, it doesn't. It goes to the hearing officer. So you can make darn sure that when we come back and we are adopting this, that we are going <laughs> we'll to get a motion. Yeah. And and yeah. it will have to get changed because this is just one of those things that we're it's so frustrating for a workshop where we can give them formal direction on change it now instead of changing it later at, between first and second reading. All right. I'm, I, I'm okay with it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to wait. Because sometimes I, I mouth things I'll over. I talk to some more people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Vice Mayor Stokes wants to work on you. That's why. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what do you change your votes? Okay. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, especially <laughs> with sunshine laws there, uh, Vice Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll do it on the days. Yeah. Okay, uh, where are we? Commissioner McDowell, you're in the queue. Did you have something else or no? Uh, Vice Mayor, did you have something else? Okay. I do. Okay, go ahead, Here's Commissioner the Rich. Yep. There's his belly. <laughs> got a question for staff. Um, when you rewrote this and you got this draft going, did you present it to like the city's economic division or maybe the Chamber of Commerce? Uh, committee for any of their inputs or suggestions, or did you just bring it to us? Uh, we brought it to the Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, and we've brought it to the Commission. Um, and one of the primary reasons with that is because of the sensitivity of sign regulations and the strict scrutiny with uh, regard to the First and Fourteenth Amendment. And um, again, our our expert outside legal counsel, Weiss Sirota did materially participate in the preparation of this draft to ensure that it is um, compliant with case law. And so we were concerned that presenting it to various boards and organizations would result in the, the ask for wholesale changes that may or may not be consistent with the case law. Um, signs are, are a special animal. Um, so, you know, when we talk about next steps before we close out the meeting, the natural resources chapter is being presented to the Environmental Advisory Board tonight in advance of uh, PZAB and you all seeing it to get their recommendations on it. Signs are a little bit of a different monster. Okay, I understand that, but now that this big animal is now out in the open, would you be looking to get some of the input, especially from the business communities out there? <laughs> yes, uh, no, yeah. maybe. We can certainly do that um, if the if the commission feels it's important. I mean, I think after this workshop, the sign chapter and this meeting are going to be online mm -hmm. uh, for everyone to peruse and see and. We always um, are open to receiving emails, phone calls. There'll be at least one more meeting where this um, ordinance is considered. So, I mean, if the commission directs us to present it to CDAB, we'll present it to CDAB. Um, we're always willing to do whatever it is that, that you ask. All right, and also I've got two other things. One is, is when we first started to write this ULDC, and I know signs are a pain, but it's like 48 pages long just for signs within the city of Northport. I thought we were consolidating and cutting everything back and trying to get, you know, a nice little flush movement with our ULDC when it comes out. I just can't see how this can be 48 pages long. Well, one of the things that's important to note that the draft was presented to you with all of the whereas clauses. Um, that we'll that's what I'm getting. Yeah. It is the ordinance. Um, so, so the whereas clauses are not going to be part of the sign regulations. Um, Thank you, because that's what I was looking at, and I've seen it over and over again, and I'm, at least that, that'll make it a lot easier to digest. I just wanted to get that out there. Yes, and, and we are. Um, where we are able to, um, we are... We are consolidating language. We're getting rid of the wordiness. Um, 
the sign chapter, again, because of the potential exposure, we've, we've really got to be careful with the sign regulations. Um, I, can't, I can't quote the figure right now. I don't know if Elaine is looking for it, but as I was working on the draft last week, we are down from 597 is my best guess pages down to somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 something um, so wow. far. Of course, the um, appendix with the definitions is not complete, um, but we, we, are, we are getting there and we think that we have a clean, concise draft that's easy to follow, even in light of these sign regulations um, that, that, that do insert some of that case law and findings in language that's legally necessary. Yes, thank you. I mean, that, that just scared me because I'm saying, oh, my Lord, we got a lot going on there. And, you know, y'all cited the Gilbert and, and Reed thing. Um, I don't know if any of the other commissioners actually took the time to see what that was all about. The, the city was being more restrictive over the church because the church was a mobile church going from place to place to place. And the city wanted them to put a date on it. Therefore, it was becoming more restricted than any of the other signs that were out there. So, yes, they were counting signs, but they were making the church go one step further, and that's why they got sued. They were not sued because of the content. It was by the city trying to make them change their sign, which they had won because they were moving around, but that sign wouldn't have been usable anymore if they went out next week. That's where the lawsuit came from, and that's why they won. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's all I got. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Just to comment on Commissioner Emmerich's statement, while that may have been the reason for the lawsuit, the, the court decision made it extremely clear and took it well beyond probably the point of why the, 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 the litigation was filed in the first place mm -hmm. and therein lies the problem because it, it is much more pervasive. But that said, I wanna get back to something else. It was my understanding that this chapter was gonna be at least uh, presented in a question and answer kind of session for the chamber. I know the chamber signage is a big, is an important issue mm -hmm. for them. I, that was my understanding, and so I was just wondering, you know, I, I believe it was their expectation, and, and it probably would benefit since it affects them greatly to understand some of these legal nuances so they can better express those, those issues to their, you know, to their membership. Um, if they were to make that request, I believe they already did, but if they haven't and they do, you know, is, will staff entertain a, a sit down with them? You know, when, obviously don't get a vote, but they obviously ought to be able to ask questions. You know, or they could listen to this meeting, but, mm -hmm. you know, they don't always. And, you know, for other chapters, we have provided that opportunity. I just wouldn't want to think that we just, you know, turn down a request for this if they, in fact, make it. And for that matter, anybody makes it. I mean, they ought to be able to ask their questions, get answers face to face. <laughs> you know, I don't know what anybody thinks. I mean, have you, let's put it this way have you gotten a, or was there a request from the chamber to review Chapter 5? No, no, this is news to us. So I'm okay. not aware of, right. of a request Good. to review it. Um, you know, if, so, if, if, if there's an ask, we will okay. we will do our best to accommodate. I, I, for sure. I thought there was, but yeah. I could stand corrected. And, and they've never been shy. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Anyway. City manager. I did talk to Bill Gunn, and it may have been a week or two ago. And I think he said he did want um, a one on one with you and Elaine, like he had had in the past. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. sure. I'm sorry, I wasn't aware. Yeah. yeah. There was, okay. Good. Maybe like a week. They've always made them ago. themselves. Mm -hmm. Thank you, CM. Uh, Commissioner McDowell? Yeah, um, great conversation today. I know that staff and the attorneys, all of the attorneys have been very um, involved in trying to bring something to us. At the beginning of the discussion, I think it was you, Ms. Laurie, that had said that you were quite surprised that 
The sign code was never updated since 2015 when Gilbert Reed. Um, being involved with the ULDC rewrite since we hired University of Florida, um, that was supposed to be the first plan to get done was the sign code. In 2015 with University of Florida, um, as you know that the ULDC has morphed and morphed again and morphed again. And that is why the sign code never got addressed because each time the commission, previous commissioners would say, when are we gonna see the sign code? When are we gonna see the sign code? Oh, it's coming with the ULDC, it's coming with the ULDC. So that's why it's never been addressed. And I just wanted you to hear the rest of the story so that way then you know. Thank you. All right, um, do we have any public comment? All right, and then closing, I just wanted to put out there, thank you for the presentation. I know it's been very arduous and, and a long, long process as Commissioner McDowell has said, this is like forever going on with CULDC. But I also want to recognize today is Earth Day, April 22nd. Um, first Earth Day was in 1970, and that began in Ohio. So if anyone is from Ohio out there, but unfortunately it's because I don't remember the name of the river, but it caught on, it caught on fire. I remember that. And uh, so there was a senator from Ohio, and I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, who said we need to establish an Earth Day so this never happens again. Unfortunately, it continues to happen. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's do something for Earth Day on, on your own and uh, embrace our wonderful planet. Well, this is Earth Month. We've had a couple cards. of yes. celebrations right. already, haven't right. we? But especially today, you know, pick up that little piece of litter, do something good for our planet today. Just real quick, um, you, you made me remember it. In 2020, the commission at that time gave a directive to have the ULDC um, set parameters and policy on wildlife signs. Um, the wildlife signs are for sandhill cranes, go for oh, tortoises, yeah. right. anything mm -hmm. wildlife related so that we can have them as part of city signage to protect our wildlife. Um, when we made that directive, they were gonna bring it back as a separate policy, but then the city manager at that time said, or staff at that time says, you know, it would be better if we just incorporate it with the ULDC because that's coming soon. And it just got kind of stuck on the back burner. And so we really need to address the wildlife signs. What kind of signs, how big are those? And, and that needs to be addressed in here. I don't want that to get forgotten. Are, are the wildlife signs placed in public right of way by the city? Uh, you're going to have to get with staff on that. Right. It could be. It could right, because some... when you think about wildlife, it, it does align with the public health, safety, and welfare um, for wildlife crossings, for we... awareness. And if they're placed in the city right-of-way, then they're a government sign. And may I suggest... If they're placed by us. So yes. we will look into it for you. May I suggest you go back and listen to the September 22nd, 2020 commission meeting because we didn't want every block to have a sign. We, we wanted there to be some kind of a, a stated policy on where those signs go, what those signs consist of. And so I, I just wanted to put that out there, just make sure that you go back and just review that meeting um, okay. and listen to the conversation. It really wasn't that long of a conversation. So I just wanted to throw that out there and thank you, Mayor, for reminding sure. me about Earth Day and our wildlife. Okay, oh, are we through with any manager or anything? City clerk, anything? Okay, so it is 201, 202, and I adjourn this meeting.